Доброго дня. So, good morning, dear participants of this event. So, this is a wonderful study done by so many organizations, Ukrainian Institute. Among them, so please, all your applause to our wonderful researchers of Ukrainian Institute. They will represent this unique survey to you on Ukrainian studies and Crimean Tatar studies in the world and beyond, in Europe and beyond. And it's really nice for us. We're so happy that we've become the partners of this event. Uh, we helped our partners for this survey to become not uh, to become available not only in Ukrainian for researchers but also in English and you can find it by the way on the website of Ukrainian Institute already it's there and uh, it will be presented online on Facebook for those who actually found out about it out of our publications there on this platform so today we will have two wonderful sessions two wonderful panels we're so grateful to partners who helped us with the organization of this truly wonderful survey we speak of European Cultural Foundation and uh, we have Goethe Institute, Cervantes Institute, EUNIC and all of them like Ukrainian Institute they promote their cultures in the world but they help also Ukrainian culture like in the broad sense of the word to become help it to become equal great part of the family of similar institutions and projects and uh, today we will have two sessions or two panels part of our speakers they're online with us and some of them are in the hall in Kiev and we do hope we do hope that definitely today any uh, that there will be no security related problems everyone joining us online you have the program uh, you have the agenda. We will have a coffee break, by the way. After the coffee break, you can join the second panel using the same link if you want to. The link, by the way, you have in your invitation. Okay, so I just want to remind you that you can switch between the channels and simultaneous interpretation if you need. In the bottom panel, you have a globe sign and uh, or a globe button. You can pick the language, whatever you like, what is more convenient. So presentations, we'll have it in two languages, Ukrainian and English. Please, you may ask questions in both languages as well. Please, don't forget for those who are online with us, you have uh, Q&A. Uh, you have this button uh, in the bottom part of the panel. Please put your questions there anytime. We will try to respond. All right, so without any hesitations, because uh, who can tell better about the survey? Who can tell better why actually we've gathered here today? The researchers themselves. So I'm really happy to present the head of information analytics of Ukrainian Institute, Ms. Nadia Koval. Uh, within a couple of months, she was leading all this huge gathering of information. She systematized it, she analyzed it. And by the way, a small spoiler in a couple of weeks, you'll see uh, even the updated interactive map on the website where you'll be able to check the updates uh, you'll have more of that on the website and more of locations where Ukrainian history and culture and politics are studied okay uh, right now we switch to the hall we switch to Kiev and I'm so happy to introduce Nadia and she will actually present Thank you, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, yeah, works. Okay, super. Dear colleagues, everyone who are in the hall, everyone staying online, I'm so happy. I'm so happy and glad to meet you at this event. And as uh, the head of information and local unit of Ukrainian Institute, the next the following 20 minutes, I will dedicate to the reason why we've gathered here, the presentation of our research, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar studies abroad. The research itself, it can be found in internet page of Ukrainian Institute in chapter analytics and research. And many of you already received it during the registration for this event. So 
Uh, I'd like to start with the following. Well, in general, the support of Ukrainian studi studies around the world, this is uh, one of the important areas for Ukrainian Institute. The state institution, which task is to support cultural diplomacy, and starting from 2020, our institute has been implementing the program of supporting Ukrainian studies, uh, named after Ivan Lysakrutnitsky. We are aimed to support Ukrainian studies uh, in various institutions abroad, like cultural and scientific. Uh, by January 23rd, we still gather these applications. Please, all Ukrainian institutions who do cooperate with such uh, foreign Ukrainian uh, study institutions, please, you may present your projects. And also, we work with online course dedicated to Ukraine. So thanks to partnership with the Data Studio and uh, Renaissance Foundation, we managed to put it on international uh, educational platform in Italian, Norwegian, French. We have this course launched, online course, English online course on Ukrainian culture about Crimean, Crimean Tatars. And basically, this format is really popular uh, the Ukrainian culture course that we launched last November has approximately 3,000 students. Thanks to partnership with the uh, Washington University, our course Ukrainian History, Culture and Identities is available on Coursera platform. This is the first Coursera uh, platform course dedicated to Ukraine. So this is our important area of our activity. The idea of the research itself uh, grew from the practical need for this program to flourish. What we lacked, this generalized information on available locations uh, in the world where Ukraine is studied, organizational and, region and uh, regional peculiarity, actual problems and challenges, opportunities, like for us to define in future these uh, uh, where should we put efforts, you know, most in a most effective way? We started this in 2021. Ukrainian Catholic University, we asked them to have the small pilot survey, and afterwards we decided to have a broader scale to expand it geographically, to uh, involve more topics in it. I mean, the Crimean Tatar studies, we had requests to different Ukrainian embassies in the world with the help of Department of Public Diplomacy of MFA. And I'm grateful to each of the embassies and they shared this really important information with us. And they also um, gave extra information from the online uh, questionnaire and open sor open data sources. In this research, we use very broad definition of what is Ukrainian study or Ukrainian studies location. So in this context, we speak about academic educational programs, uh, language, history, culture, or Crimean Tatar or Ukrainian language course. And in these universities, there are specific research centers handling these. Second block, where we speak about Ukrainian studies, these will be again uh, university or research or educational programs on regional studies. These may be post-Soviet country studies, post-communist studies, Eastern European studies, Eurasian, Slavic studies, all around the world. You know, the conceptualization of the region, which uh, according to the thought of certain university research or Ukraine is there, these are different. This regional uh, separation and the uh, research centers are very different. In each specific case, you have just to look if the Ukrainian studies there in the activity of the center because theoretically it may cover the region practically for example it may uh, include other uh, countries there may be no specialist on Ukrainian studies but as I say we need to take the programs in which specialists are there third the type of the organizations that we studied, independent research and analytical centers handling Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar issues in the framework of regional research. This, quite, this is a matter of discussion, like do we need to include these analytical centers to the list of our locations, but we think that in analytical centers and think tanks, the knowledge is generated about modern Ukraine, its policy, its place in the world, 
and uh, international arena, these think tanks are much more influential, you know, uh, when it comes to politics. Uh, they shape the, the policies of countries, not just the academic centers. We can see right now that for this area, what is really, uh, what is the trend for it? Researchers do work there. So we took these as well, and uh, we had to do it manually, uh, to analyze manually if they do, uh, if they are interested in Ukraine or not. After we gathered information and created the first base of these locations, we created an online questionnaire, sent it in June, October 2022, and we define, uh, we identified two areas. Organizational peculiarity, what are the centers, what topics are they handling, what formats, how big they are, and so on. And we asked so many evaluating questions, like what the key problems are, how do they see solutions, how do they evaluate the dynamics of development. The last question was, what influence uh, had the full-scale aggression of Russia had on their activity? The general results of the questionnaire actually get it. Uh, the first results of the survey may be there in the report. You may find it in the report. This is the interactive map of Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar studies abroad, by the way. It's placed on a web page of Ukrainian Institute. It was placed in November, by the way, and it contains information about 169 locations. So we took this broad term of uh, the study. In 32 countries of the world, you can actually search them on the map, filter by the state, by type and form, by relevance. So please, you are so welcome to use the map. For example, when you design or draft a project and how to cooperate with different organizations around the world, your updates, your comments, maybe to exclude some of these locations, because in our understanding, this map should be a living one, a relevant one and reflect uh, the Ukrainian studies uh, reality. It's in Ukrainian on the website, but we prepared an English version of the map. As Hanna said, this English map will be added and we will update the design. The research itself that I tell about contains two chapters. In the first, we represent the results of basically the survey for the studies locations and uh, the challenges they actually face. Second chapter is much more voluminous, and apart from the survey, it uh, is backed by secondary sources, many of them. No, it's still not there. Yeah, in the lower part. Uh, consultations with experts also, because we decided to trace some regional specificities of development of Ukrainian studies in certain regions of the world. You can see what are the key regions there. Defined USA, Canada, Western Europe, uh, subregions like Central Eastern Europe with subregions Tur Turkey, Russia, and former USSR, Eastern Asia, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. Of course, the choice and the division of uh, the countries and the regions, it's a uh, it was happening partially manually, but we tried to see the logics, how uh, the locations were created in these studies, how they were related to some kind of diaspora moments, and how how close they are uh, in their themes and similar things. So this division into regions and, of course, the uniqueness of each country in such regional analysis, it gives us the opportunity to understand certain trends of how uh, Ukrainian studies are developed in this or other region. And in order not to talk a lot, we are switching to the results. So here I chose, excuse me, it should be here. So here I chose a few interesting results from the general survey and on the page of the text we can see that if we take all of these locations of Ukrainian studies in the global scale, so thematically most of them are uh, engaged in Ukrainian culture, a bit less teaching Ukrainian language and even less Ukrainian history or literature. In other words, uh, as for Ukrainian studies, all over the world and earlier also historically we see the publications of the post-war times uh, we had um, 
this orientation to language and culture and internal analysis of ourselves, not the place of Ukraine in the world as something political, but more like somehow even ethnographic analysis about that this problem should be solved. And people are talking about that for a long time already. And we don't have to generalize this because uh, earlier there are a lot of centers of uh, different studies and in Ukraine they are most developed. But if we take this general analysis all over the world, like the culture and language studies, they are dominating. And the second peculiarity that we saw shows that absolutely most Dear colleagues, we are coming back to our presentation. Unfortunately, now in Kyiv we have problems with the blackouts, so now we are working using the generator. I am really sorry uh, for all of those who lost our translation for like uh, 10 minutes. We've been talking that most of the centers in Ukraine exist at uh, state universities uh, and research centers, so they are relying on this uh, state financing and they are dependent on the policy and the requests from students, some state or uh, some private programs and almost all the studies, they underline that they lack state support uh, from Ukraine because in many other states and not only like Russian Federation but Poland and Czech Republic, uh, there are such programs and under such conditions it is easier for them to function. It is very important also that when we are talking about uh, the locations of Ukrainian studies, in the first place there is always lack of financing and it's usually institutional financing for the support of uh, activities of uh, separate locations and also financing of certain projects. And again, Ukrainian state does not pay enough attention to them. It's a sec it's of the second priority. So among the 60 uh, locations, they ask about this attention, about uh, this support. And it's not always about money. Like, we want more attention from diplomatic representatives of Ukraine abro from abroad. And we would like to have some organizational support, help in networking and other things. So it's a cry for help, so please pay attention to us, it exists. And the third uh, problem, which is of high priority, is that many Ukrainian studies uh, suffer because the target audience has no enough interest. It might be related to that Ukraine as a topic is not really popular, so nowadays in 2022 it's less relevant because there is huge growth of interest towards Ukraine, but it might be a really painful issue in many countries. We've been talking about uh, point number four, problem number four, uh, absence of prospects and working in this sphere because there is no work for bachelors, for masters and students. They are not interested to take s such programs and responsibly the programs might be closed or they function in some limited scale. So these are the biggest problems determined by our participants. Other problems, potential problems that we've been talking about that maybe universities are not interested or the country or there is lack of qualified staff. So these problems are secondary based on what we've been talking about previously, financing from the state and the need to make target audiences in those countries interested and to show that actual specialization or um, the being an expert in uh, Ukrainian studies gives some prospects. Expectations of uh, Ukrainian uh, from Ukrainian state, they are obvious, uh, grant support of projects, support of connections between uh, the foreign Ukrainian studies and studies and scientists from Ukraine. So it requires also uh, some acquaintance, let us say so. So it's not the case of some famous locations of Ukrainian studies like Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies of Harvard, but there are Ukrainian studies that are not well known in Ukraine itself and that will be about the locations in Southern Asia or Korea or other countries, but also in some smaller countries and cities, cities of Eastern Europe. This problem exists and we would like to cooperate more with such people. And of course, it's institutional financial support of Ukrainian studies. That is the state of Ukraine 
to finance their existence because if uh, there is like finance in this or other way just some programs and for support of the studies there is no financing then of course it causes certain problems and also people say that in order to get some students um, we need to give to the students of Ukrainian studies give some grants and the last of the results of uh, the survey I would like to share is a problem and now we are talking a lot about this problem actually there is a whole discussion in the society for uh, these locations of regional studies as I mentioned uh, the Eastern European post USSR and so on uh, historically from the times when those were centers of uh, the USSR that were created at the times of the Cold War the accent is paid on some Russian visions and Russian approaches to the study of the culture of the region so it has uh, different levels of influence and that we have some expertise in Ukraine and the expertise of war um, also that might be a bit of a different approach and uh, nowadays there is a discussion uh, about conceptual conceptual about con concepts in this approach in different regions it's not to ban the Russian studies because nobody is going to ban those because Russian studies have their own own value but if we are talking about regional studies they should not be substituted by Russian studies but all the countries all the cultures of certain regions should be represented there and the last thing I would like to mention there about regional peculiarities of Ukrainian studies we've been mentioning in our second chapter so actually from the survey from the study we can see that there are two key things for presence or non presence of studies in different countries this is availability of big and huge diaspora which is financing and promoting such studies and are their consumers also political interests sometimes caused by historical interests so the most developed centers are in the USA Canada Poland is a huge leader in the world and also actively developed in Germany so if the diaspora is younger or smaller and the political attention is paid to other regions so for example in France and Italy we will see less development of Ukrainian studies uh, but there will be more Russian if the country is neighboring for example Romania or Hungary but the priority political priority is not really high and the activity of the dias diaspora is uh, not high then the Ukrainian studies will be really limited in there also in the example of the uh, Slovak country uh, we can see that availability of uh, diaspora or minority in the country it's not linear because uh, in uh, the Slovak country there were serious Ukrainian studies but with assimilation of Ukrainian diaspora they started to be closed and also a range of uh, Ukrainian studies in Australia all were closed because they were existing due to the diaspora mainly because of lack of students what we mentioned already in Brazil or Latin America there is a huge Ukrainian community but weak studies we didn't even separate this region because we did not have enough studies in there in Scandinavian countries from the other side the interest uh, is uh, caused by some political things and correspondingly in the uh, latter years and uh, the studies are developed quite dynamically and we will have the speaker from that region who will mention this and also it is very important after um, our independence uh, Ukrainian studies developed in democratic countries of uh, Eastern Asia for example in Japan and the uh, Korean Republic so here we have to be interested in order to develop cooperation with this region and uh, quite actively Ukrainian studies are developed in China uh, there is like a lot of people who are studying Ukrainian but these studies they are closed and they don't uh, really come to contact and they are cooperating with the Ukrainian institutes um, and also in uh, Soviet times uh, Ukrainian studies they were not uh, existing abroad let us say so and they started lately they were like suffering in that in the ideology space because 
there were some historical studies, but after 2014, most of them uh, were not developing, and after 2022, uh, the last more or less independent location was closed. So I would like to mention that in many countries of the global south from Latin America and Near East and Southern Southern Eastern Asia, there is no factor such as diaspora, political interest, and also almost no Ukrainian uh, studies, Ukrainian locations. So if we have development in these regions, so probably we have to pay attention to this as well. And at the end, I would like to mention I'd like to mention the most important thing I forgot, Crimean Tatar studies. We included that in uh, our survey as well, and it was really interesting how these are related to Ukrainian studies, not related right now. Basically, there's uh, there are certain Turkish programs, mostly linguistic, and take Crimean Tatar literature and language in the context of Turkish uh, language and dialects, similar in Germany. There are many researchers who study Crimean Tatar issue merging in these networks, but creating a center which will simultaneously handling Ukrainian Crimean Tatar issues, it's, it will be there in the future. And I think I should stop here. And I pass the floor, I guess, to our moderator, and he will start the So, dear colleagues, dear colleagues, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to take part in, uh, as it was said in the invitation, this intellectual uh, feast. So, I'd like to uh, congratulate the Ukrainian Institute. Well, congrats, ladies and gentlemen. In this difficult time to concentrate, to focus, and uh, get this very, very sensitive and very important research, you know, it's really a success. I had no opportunity, unfortunately, to read the whole text, but it looks very, very, very uh, promising to me. I think this will be become a benchmark. The survey will become a benchmark for many researchers who want to work with Ukrainian studies abroad and for colleagues handling Ukrainian studies abroad, just to understand what the situation is and to understand what the problems are there emerging in this specific part. First, actually, to understand if this area itself is perspective. Does it have potential? Because right now it's gaining some new uh, power in the modern context where Ukraine is as a state and our researchers are. So I'd like to invite, I'd like to invite the participants. Ms. Olha Budnik, advisor to the President of Ukraine on the Fund of the President of Ukraine for the support of education, science and sports. Yeah. She's with us, okay, great. We also have Mr. Anton Legusha, Dean of the Faculty of the Social Sciences Mentees, Master of Studies of Kiev School of Economics. Online with us, we also have some participants, Simona Tilo Belletza, Assistant Professor at the Department of Social Sciences, University of Naples, Federico II, Catherine Younger, Research Director of Ukraine and European Dialogue Program at the Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna. Okay, take into consideration the experience of the first session. Okay, if we have any technical problems again or difficulties, we will have to take a break if that happens. But uh, you can see that not more than 10 minutes it takes. So if you lose us <laughs> at some point, I'd like our audience and our guests staying online, please don't leave us. We will return definitely. Uh, our guests on the hall, of course, we'll make a break again, but then we'll resume. So, I'd like to tell a little bit about the rules of the session, as I see it, as a moderator. So, each of the participants, uh, each of the panelists will get approximately 10 minutes for introductory remarks. Like, what would you like to say? What is a key message? After that, for each of you, I'll have one question. After that, we'll pass the floor to... Our audience and I think our audience will give some added value with some comments remarks and questions okay and uh, according to the agenda I'd like to pass the floor to Miss Olga okay so Miss Olga Budnik uh, you have a chance right now to tell to give us your vision uh, on the panel topic so Ukrainian studies before the words institutional dimension please share your vision 
do share. In your opinion, what was happening in Ukrainian studies abroad? What was happening in this context? What happened in positive sense? What problems there were? What should we do to avoid these problems? You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for the invitation, this important discussion today. Uh, when we talk about Ukrainian studies, I think that we have to consider these in a couple of aspects. If we speak about the period, the pre-war period, yeah, pre-full-scale war period, let's say, yeah, uh, I think that Ukrainian Institute presented a very broad picture like how it was before the war. If we try to summarize it briefly, we have just to understand that historical aspect of Ukrainian studies emergence, what was it about? The idea was to separate it from the Russian in the context that during the Cold War uh, we had this concept emerge as Soviet studies, yeah? Um, when the Soviet space or the Soviet community was studied. At that moment, Ukrainian was a part of the USSR, it was the Ukrainian Republic, an element of it. It was like something general, you know? After, Ukraine, uh, after the USSR uh, declined, uh, these started breaking out, you know, the, all these parts of it, and uh, the watershed line appears, and our neighbor took it as a basis, you know? The majority of those Soviet studies were turned into Russian studies, and we can see that in the world there are so many, relatively many, let's say, many uh, locations and uh, islands of Slavic Russian studies, East European studies, and somewhere there through the prism of all these studies, Ukraine was also included as a part. It was a good remark from you that definitely before we had no this no specific state policy on how to represent ourselves in other countries. And our um uh, well, Russian Federation used that for their benefit. It's not a secret for anyone that they promoted very actively such a narrative or a statement like Ukraine as a failed state. Yeah, they did it uh, actively that Ukraine did not manage to become a state. Uh, each of the governments tried to present its opposite statement explaining that Ukraine has enough of arguments and uh, an affirmance to be considered as a subject, not an object on the political map. And uh, we fought with that, not very systemically. We tried to oppose this thing, but not in a very systemic way. If we go to the reasons like where Ukrainian studies were presented and the best way they emerged where the diaspora was the most powerful one, you know? And uh, right now, all these Ukrainian studies that are presented existing in the U.S., in Canada, in Australia. Well, Australia, unfortunately, the it's closed there. But Germany was mentioned. The endowment funds were established. Right now, we're looking at Ukrainian studies not like a separate element or area in the context of In the context of academic development, Ukrainian studies right now are a part of uh, national security. When we speak about the foreign policy, yes, Ukrainian foreign policy, in which way we have to be presented, in which way we can be presented, how the picture is changing now after the February 24th, what we observe and what we've seen, what we've analyzed, because we have to trace how those are moving, those who promoted the Ukraine as a failed state concept. In some countries, by the way, this narrative is uh, is boiling. It's still there. It's settled there. Uh, 2022 changed uh, the ideas of many people and changed many statements, even the decision makers one. We can see that there is such a bit, big demand and interest for who like for what Ukraine is and how Ukraine is developing, what that is. For 31 year of independence, we already have 31 year of independence. We finally started talking of restoration of independence within 31 year. This is a country, Ukraine is a country with a big history, huge history, Ukrainian studies. It's obvious that in classical format, they have specific dimension like specific disciplines promoting it, history, language, culture. What we do right now, what we propose to do additionally, again, there was a statement here today that there is a small interest to Ukraine as it is. 
as the uh, we represent the Presidential Foundation to support uh, education, science, and sports. We use the approach of Ukraine as case study. We've designing specific cases showing that Ukraine is handling the challenges it has right now uh, after February 24th, just to uh, activate the interest of academic community. We do not speak only about language, history, culture. Yeah, of this realm. We speak about energy area, cyber security area, also educational area, healthcare, because for the world right now, we're a big source of not only inspiration, I can say, like <laughs> we are, but also we are an example of how can you handle certain situations because many critical problems that we have for the world this is a matter of big interest how we handle that how we manage to overcome it and this overcoming can be taken as a basis we use the harvard uh standard we have four cases designed and uh we'll work with them later we can present these cases for discussion later for business schools for um any joint classes you know for our professors to deliver any lectures implemented in the curricula and uh give additional extra give additional topics for discussion for external discussion where we are moving forward we're trying to raise the level improve the level of interest in ukraine and ukrainian studies we're trying to make it more systemic the biggest problem is funding of course uh we do not need to nurture these illusions please don't expect that in a year or two we'll get a lot of money just to support Ukrainian studies development? I don't think so, but we have so many other ways and how can we do it? Uh, starting from the establishment of these bonds and endowment funds and uh, by, uh, well, many Russian assets we do hope will be uh, transferred to Ukrainian disposal and part of them may be used also to continue with Ukrainian studies, promotion and development. But what is really important, what is really interesting, I'd like to note, we have to take our neighbor, we, we, we need to observe the neighbor, what they're doing, what happened after February 24th. Russian Federation, they issued a separate dec decree, I will even quote that. Uh, with that decree, uh, with this document, a document regulates the humanitarian, uh, foreign humanitarian policy. This is like a humanitarian policy concept for Russian Federation abroad. And it didn't happen before February 24th, but after. And they used this policy and they clarified what they should do there. And it is stipulated that they also have to establish these uh, specialized units in foreign universities where Russian language will be used as a language of international communication for delivery, uh, opening... Uh, well, establishing uh, units of Russian u universities elsewhere, help by help, like helping a Russian youth to get some education, supporting Russian studies in the world, opening uh, new Russian uh, study centers in the prominent universities. They do this not only in Western countries, they realize, they understand very well, well, we can be frank, you know, they take the countries where we have weaker diplomatic connections, they move there, they try to enhance their presence in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and so on. It means that right now, in the places where we have active support, where we are actively communicating and we have so many positive results in different countries of the world, uh, we're in economic communities, they are ready to open Ukrainian studies including the University of Great University of Great Britain and uh, European universities, American universities, they're interested in that. We work in the field right now where we have these fruits, you know, where we have the harvest, but we have also to move to Asia, approach the Asia, approach Latin America, not to miss this opportunity, you know, and uh, to have a, a strong, loud voice there, because what is the policy? Making Ukrainian voice louder, you know, at all continents. And uh, what is really important to understand for us, what is important for us? It's not just done by one organization in Russia. They have at least three specific institutions handling these issues. Uh, Russian Cooperation, Ruski Mir Foundation, and Harchakov's Fund. So we have to understand that they diversify their representation. They behave differently. What can they do? They can use very plain language to talk to various 
uh, peers abroad and why I pay so much attention to Russian Federation. Because again, I want to stress, Ukrainian studies today, it's not exclusively the area, of the academic area. It's a part of national security. And by uh, establishing this policy, formulating policy, understanding on how should we how should we be presented correctly abroad, understanding the challenges, understanding the risks, and who is opposing us? We should know that. Uh, before we move to this more peaceful way of uh, handling the conflict, as uh, representatives, representatives of other countries do, like French-German institutions, like they do it. I do hope that someday Ukrainian Institute will actually do the same thing, will be globally present all around the world promoting Ukrainian culture. But right now we have to use it as an element of countering the propaganda to have stronger position all around the world. Thank you. We received the point of view on Ukrainian studies and uh, somehow to Russian studies from Ukraine. And now we are switching to Neapel. And I invite to the word Mr. Simone Atelier Bledza. Ukrainian studies abroad, and you have approximately 10 minutes for it. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to share my presentation. I hope that you can see it. Yep. Hello, I would like to thank Ukrainian Institute and especially Alexander Haida for the invitation to take part in this conference. Secondly, I would like to excuse me for my not knowing Ukrainian language. That is why I prefer to read the speech, not to speak freely. And I would also like to thank uh, the armed forces of Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation in general uh, who at this moment are defending uh, the democracy and freedom of the whole Europe. So the first thing you should know in order to understand the condition of Ukrainian studies in Italy is that in Italian institutes, disciplines organizing the so-called scientific disciplinary sectors, they are very important because that is in them we Italians can get habilitation to teach in the university and correspondingly to work. These sectors have really wide definitions and names. For example, we don't have the sector of Ukrainian language and literature or the history of Ukraine, but we have only the Slavic studies and the new history. In such a manner, those who are studying Ukrainian studies in Italy, they happen to be in sectors where other Slavists are dominating as uh, teachers of Russian literature or other historians as like history of Italy who are regulating the access to uh, universities and also in different centers uh, and in departments, different courses might take place who are more targeted. But among these courses, there are those who are dedicated to Ukrainian studies. Uh, for example, courses of Ukrainian language and literature that exist uh, in uh, Milano Institute. Due to this, even if this is not theoretically impossible, it is really hard to create uh, the research and scientific center as such uh, that are existing in Northern uh, America. And the main part of the activity is done by persons who almost all are coordinated by Italian Association of Ukrainian uh, Studies, ISO. And uh, this association was born, was founded in 1989 on the well-known conference organized by Ricardo Pica and um, Harvard Institute in Gargulami about uh, questioning of uh, Kievras and actually it was founded in 1993 and since then it's the main forum of Ukrainian studies in Italy. Although with some variations activity of the 
association was limited from one side by a small number of scientists and financing, from the other side by popularity of traditional and Russian approach, which always was doubting legitimacy of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. And such events as uh, Orange Revolution or Revolution of Dignity, of course, put Ukraine into the center of uh, the public opinion, but still it had some consequences on academic level, excluding some conferences about the political situation of that time. I think that in the past, the most significant members of association like Giovanni Doji, who is still our president, and Grazioza Oksana Pachlovska, they dedicated themselves to, to upbringing of the next generation of scientists who were first born as specialists uh, in Ukrainian uh, studies, Alexandra Akili, Marko Poleri, Oleg Romyantsev, and probably me myself. Uh, full-scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine after the 24th of February was taken by these two generations of scientists as the possibility to push institutionalization of Ukrainian studies abroad, and the members of the association participated in thousands of public initiatives aimed at clarification of this uh, to Italian um, communities and participation in uh, TV shows and also the local communities in Xenia Constantinenko in Veneto and Massimo Tria in uh, Cagliari and Toscana and efforts on information informating they all were shown by the two books published one by me and um, it was written for the wide range of specialists and the fact that Italian public opinion, which was traditionally absolutely pro-Russian, now is supporting Ukraine is a result partially of our efforts and the decision not to avoid our public dedication and explain the reasons to support Ukraine. As for the informating also, this fear of translating from Ukrainian is included here. And Alexandra Hili and Yerina Hrusha, they translated the first anthology of Ukrainian poets in Italian. And poets of uh, uh, Ukraine, Poeti d'Ukraina, it's uh, poetry starting from Vasily Stus, and those are poems published in the internet. Uh, for example, Irina Shovalova's uh, poems and also Alexander translated um, Elena Zabushka's texts. And uh, together with Irina, they are working on the second anthology dedicated to poems about Kyiv. And also in a historical uh, since we tried to translate new and important texts in March this year, we will have Italian translations of uh, the studies of Oksana uh, Kis, uh, of uh, Ukrainians in Hulag to survive, it means to win, and also Yaroslav Retsak uh, to cope the past. And you can uh, see these books in Italian as well. Uh, so it seems to me that it should be underlined that the translation was possible thanks to the donations of Ukrainian communities of Rome and Sardinia. This is a sign that even if um, not on the level of diaspora in the USA, Ukrainian diaspora in Europe also starts finding some stability and is promoting spreading Ukrainian culture in different countries. During the last year, the members of the associations were cooperating in two modules dedicated to Ukrainian culture and history. And we organized that in the Palermo um, Institute and uh, Southern Institute of um, Napoli. And we made it possible so that these are collective courses and each teacher taught a lesson on the topic which they knew best. In the Palermo, Messini, Rome, Venice and Turin, there were courses of Ukrainian language, and a lot of those courses were 
undertaken by students uh, not only within the universities because with increasing number of refugees uh, uh, there was a high demand of uh, people who are speaking Ukrainian and thanks to Emiliano Rano efforts we are working on creating the first allied school of Ukrainian studies which will take place most probably next year from the point of view of growth of educational offers, it is worth underlining that these new courses might happen to be just a flash. And currently, Ukrainian studies have more funds in order to eliminate the extraordinary situation and to satisfy the requests from the citizens. But this money, this money is not divided equally. So our obligation is uh, aimed at making uh, these uh, one-time loans into stable loans. In December in Napoli, we had international conference, uh, Chernobyl as a, a historical cesura, um, organized together by um, Napoli Institute um, and Federico II and uh, the uh, Cathedral of K of um, Mahila Academy and the Howard um, Institute and also the center named after Reta Carson for society and scientists. And the aim of the conference was studying Chernobyl as an uh, event in history and ecology. And finally, the last and not the least um, achievement from the point of view of the institutionalization of Ukrainian studies uh, was uh, finding out was founding this journal and thanks to Lekromyantsev and financing which he received from the Palermo Institute soon there will be the first journal Dnipro uh, so it's a journal of uh, Ukrainian studies so which is published there it's online magazine and all the articles are written in Italian and they can be downloaded free of charge from the website of the University of Palermo or from the website of our association. Uh, this is the issue of significant efforts and studies written in Italian or translated from Ukrainian or English. But this magazine is a fu fundamental an important stage in order for Ukrainian studies to be seen in Italy with the same dignity they deserve. On the website of association, we also have bibliography of uh, uh, Ukrainian publications and also the map of Ukrainian studies, where oblasts and universities are mentioned, where there are scientists and members of ISO. At the end, I would like to underline that uh, Ukrainian studies obviously are studied by other subjects beyond our association and one of the most important among those is Mem Memoria Italia, uh, which is part of the Association of International Memorial. In addition to the conferences uh, uh, that are dedicated to war that is happening between Ukraine and Russia since 2014, Marcello Flores edited a book together with the most popular newspaper in Italia, Corriere della Sella, named uh, Ukraine as a place of democracy. And also they organized other initiatives such as meeting on the gender and LGBT minorities, which became a book um, named Queer Transnationalities. It was published in January by Pisa University Press uh, in paper form with the testing English, which can be downloaded free of charge. And it has some essays dedicated to the history of sexual minorities in Ukraine written by world experts such as Sancho Russell, German Tenyuk, Masha Beketova, and e Eugenia. I would like to mention that Ukrainian studies in Italy could react positively uh, to uh, the war where Russia wanted to destroy Ukraine as a cultural 
place and also support from our government, especially in comparison with that huge support which Moskva provided to Russian culture via institutes of Russian world. That is why we can only greet the new obligations of Ukraine in this field and the example of which is also this conference. Therefore, one more time, I would like to express uh, my desire to cooperate in the future with the Ukrainian Institute in order to strengthen and widen Ukrainian studies in Italy. I thank you for your attention and your patience to my Ukrainian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simone. Thank you for your wonderful Ukrainian, truly magnificent and very interesting presentation. Thank you for the contribution that you're personally giving and your colleagues uh, for Ukrainian studies to develop. So we go back to Kyiv right now. I'd like to pass the floor to Anton Lehusha, uh, Dean of the Department of Social and Humanitarian uh, Studies, Kiev School of Economics, please, Anton, you have 10 minutes to share your insights, the vision on how Ukrainian studies are developing. I'd like to add from myself, uh, once in your papers you wrote that we have to commercialize history. Can we commercialize Ukrainian studies? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. So the first thing I'd like to say, um, I'm so grateful to Ukrainian Armed Forces for this opportunity to stay alive and sit here with you at this table, thinking of Ukrainian studies, reading wonderful researches, and uh, in my opinion, well, it's a little bit even provocative, like, how many questions arise in our minds after we read this, the results of research? So I'd like to start from two simple cases. First, the story you all know, like... Uh, Opson, Russian researcher, went to work in the U.S. and he wrote a paper that Ukrainian language is like a dialect or whatever, a dialect of Russian. And Shevelyov came to work there as well, and he broke this theory, you know, <laughs> Jakobson's theory. Jakobson, Russian Jakobson, uh, publicly accused Shevelyov in cooperation with Nazi. Uh, this is important. Why? Because this is the story about struggle. You know, the struggle which lasts for such a long time, and it's about survival, survivability of Ukrainian studies in particular. Second story, described wonderfully in a book of American researchers, Janine Vedel. Um, she told there how big Russian business corrupted big business, sponsored so much in Harvard, a lot of things, and uh, not only specific professors, not even well, some schools even, and had some benefit out of that. So um, these two stories I combine and merge in one, the ability of Ukrainian studies to fight, to struggle. I, I apologize for using this word. This is the word we have today. Ukrainian studies are at the front line as well in some sense. And this is the, I'd like to address this question to the state. This This may be fair or not, but from the standpoint of, like how many centers of Ukrainian studies were supported directly or indirectly by Ukrainian state starting from 1991? How much support did they get? How many centers were opened by Ukrainian state? And what was there? Second thing, uh, yeah. It's about well the focus of research and in this research it's mentioned what mainly Ukrainian studies are focused. On the one hand, it's like certain ethnographic, tradition, culture, language, and so on. On the other hand, history, less for political part, political analytics or international, uh, Ukraine, uh, international position of Ukraine, mostly in shade of Russia, you know? That's how it goes in the majority of cases. For me, when it comes to survivability and uh, for us on how to overcome, for Ukrainian studies, how to overcome this. What is the biggest challenge in this aspect? I would say it's about the change, not only focus, but maybe change of academic language, because today we can see that even classic decolonization studies, we lack these, you know, for us to fully realize what is happening in Ukraine, with Ukraine, with Russia, when it comes to this former uh, colonized states, you know, former Russian colonization policy. Commerci uh, commercializing, okay, let's be frank, it's about profit. What Ukrainian studies are giving 
not inside the studies itself, but in the countries where they exist. So new knowledge, what do they generate? New knowledge, new discussions, certain practical cases, um, analytics, which helps also the parliaments, the governments, or some subjects, or even businessmen, you know, to, to know more about Ukraine, to respond, to make informed decisions, yes? And uh, in my personal opinion, we have this direct connection to commercialization, because definitely we have to understand the, the story is about, it's about money. It, this is the story because the state is not sponsoring. Ukrainian business, as far as I know, unfortunately, is not sponsoring, is not like supporting, promoting that abroad. Ukrainian studies abroad. Mostly, it's the sponsorship or either businessmen abroad or prominent researchers who live abroad or some universities do that, like Harvard University. And here, at this point, well, the last thing to mention, the most important one, I guess. Uh, the problem that we all somehow ignore is the weakness of Ukrainian studies inside Ukraine. When uh, we will seriously, uh, we will have the serious attitude to our culture, our history, you know, when we will analyze ourselves, uh, when we will analyze our society in the broadest sense, uh, I think then our researchers' voice, analysts' voice, academic voice, of course, uh, this voice is heard a little bit better, but still, it does not uh, it does not generate so much attention. Th this, this voice should be heard. It has to be heard. This is a question to ourselves, from us to ourselves. This is a question to myself as well, and how to enhance Ukrainian studies, not in the sense of this archaic, you know, sense, you know, like culture, language, history, the big pillars, like something with USSR vibe. No, it's a way for us to understand who we are again. And maybe then we will present ourselves also to foreign countries, present our knowledge, propose our knowledge, our cooperation, and we will expand uh, Ukrainian, we will, we will expand this Ukrainian vision, I'd say. Okay, broad. Okay, thank you, Anton. Thank you so much for sharing your vision. And we go back from Kiev to another country. Vienna right now and I'd like right now Miss Catherine Younger research director of Ukraine European dialogue program at the Institute for Human Sciences Vienna uh, Catherine share your vision of Ukrainian studies how do Ukrainian studies look like Sh from Stefan Platz <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you to the Ukrainian Institute for this outstanding event, for the outstanding research that you've done. This is really essential work, and I'm so glad that you're doing it and that I get to join this discussion today. Um, I'll keep my comments very short so we can have plenty of time to discuss. What I see is that actually what we're talking about as Ukrainian studies here has two different and very important projects, right? So on the one hand, there is the creation of a basic level of knowledge and placing Ukraine on students and the general public's mental maps around the world, right, so that they know what Ukraine is very basically. They may not be specialists in it, but it's something that they understand and know. And the other then, and this is something that Anton was talking about, is about producing this innovative, enlightening research that speaks to broad audiences as well. So the second of these, I am at the Institute for Human Sciences, which is an institute of advanced studies. We don't actually teach here. So that is more what I'll focus on today. But I do want to say just a few brief words about the former, right, this creation of a basic level of knowledge. Coming from my own experience being trained in U.S academia and now teaching Ukrainian history here in Vienna. I'm really heartened to see something that was quite rare when I started my studies in the early 2000s, which is students with no family ties to the region, right, who recognize what a rich field for study Ukraine is, how important it can be to start broader inquiries 
from the Ukrainian perspective, and that this brings a new light to fundamental questions, whether those are in the field of history, political science, wherever, across the humanities and social sciences. And I think this growth in recognition of this is thanks to the institutions and individuals who have done such excellent work to make it easy for those students to see why Ukraine matters, right? We're seeing a growth in the quality of sources that are available in translation, secondary literature that's produced in Ukrainian and then translated, right? So there's, it's simply easier now, and the Ukrainian Institute has played an important role in this, it's simply easier now to understand why Ukraine matters so much. I teach Ukrainian history at the Diplomatic Academy here in Vienna, so the future diplomats and international bureaucrats of the world, and nearly all of my students have no background on Ukrainian history, on Ukraine whatsoever, but recognize that it is something that will be valuable for them to know going forward in their careers. And so I think we have an opportunity here in this way, and there will be a snowball effect here, right? Because what I see is we have interest, interest is met with opportunities, those opportunities are taken advantage of, and then that creates more interest. There is such truly excellent work happening in Ukrainian studies that there is an organic process of it expanding. I'm not trying to be overly rosy. I'm not trying to be paint an overly rosy picture here, but I do think we need to be aware of the successes we're having. Um, to move, however, to this second component of Ukrainian studies, this focus on the research aspect of it. I think here what I'm going to in say is that it, from my experience in Austria, in the US, here at the IWM, it's going to be vital, even in how we frame the question of Ukrainian studies, to break out of any sort of narrow boundaries or definition of what Ukrainian studies is going to be. This is saying, right, that I'm thinking of that in terms of crossing disciplinary boundaries, but also not saying that Ukraine needs to be studied as an entity in and of itself without recognizing the connections and crossings and entanglements more broadly. And I say this for one very um, sort of practical reason in confronting the existing academic establishment. And this gets to some degree at what Simone was talking about, about like the establishment of categories in which we're teaching and in which you can be qualified, right? So if we're pushing away from post-Soviet studies, East European studies, however it's currently framed, but as we are well aware, by default, it does center Russia. If we're going to try to push away from that in an institutional sense, I think we're going to have to offer a different model and conceptual framework that doesn't entirely re rely on the national issue, right? There are entrenched biases within the academy, which simply will not be quick to change. There are people who have been trained in an older system, institutions are set up in that way. We have to recognize that as much as we are convinced that it's important for change to happen, it may not happen as fast as we want. So then I'm thinking along the lines of, why don't we rise above and say, look, we have a model, we have a way of thinking about the world, exploring intellectual questions that starts from Ukraine, moves outward and explores the world in a new way. I'm thinking as, especially as a historian, where entangled global transnational approaches are so fruitful in the Ukrainian case, where Ukraine actually, as Tim Snyder has said many times, Ukraine becomes hypertypical, right? Where things find a condensation in the Ukrainian case that elucidates them for the world more broadly. And I think this is one of the cases that we can be making. Other examples come to mind, borderland studies that include Ukraine as a case alongside others, right? There are lots of ways that we can do this. And this is right in the wheelhouse of the Institute for Human Sciences where I'm based. So I feel very fortunate to be in a position to push Ukrainian studies forward in this way here. So a little word about IWM, it's physically in Vienna, but we are very much a cosmopolitan initiative. We are an institute of advanced studies that brings in fellows from around the world who come together to work on their own proposed research projects. We do not impose a research agenda on them for a period of time and then go to their home institutions. Um, the IWM is built on the tradition of encounter on equal footing, so it began its life as a place for East European dissident intellectuals in the 80s to come together with their Western European counterparts, recognizing that both of them have contributions to make to that intellectual encounter and exchange that are of equal value. 
Um, so then that it was a very natural thing for us to do to include Ukrainian scholars and thinkers into that project as well. Beginning in the wake of the Maidan, we've had an institutionalized program, U Ukraine and European Dialogue, which has brought around 100 fellow visiting fellows from Ukraine to the IWM for a period of time. There they are able to interact with their peers from across Europe and North America and indeed the world. Um, they bring their own projects, which often place Ukraine in this broader context. And we're able to say, look, if we have somebody here who's working on questions of presidential, of uh, semi-presidential regimes, right? Can they then talk to others who are working in a comparative context about that? If we have people who are exploring the questions of post-truth, where are they going to fit into these bigger discussions? Um, and now in the wake of the uh, full-scale invasion in February, we've added a program called Documenting Ukraine, which says we need to support Ukrainians who are creating a record of the Ukrainian experience of the war, and that is going to be an intellectual con contribution in the long run that also speaks to the broader world. Um, and here, another the, the, the final thing that I want to bring in here is the... Um, how lucky we are that the that institutions like the Ukrainian Institute exists with their expansive vision of the future of Ukrainian studies, where it's intersectional, inclusive, innovative. And then we like minded in organizations can band together to push other institutions in that direction. Right. So I think very fondly of a cooperation that the IWM did with the Ukrainian Institute and the Center for Urban History in 2019, a multi day uh, conference and public event program called Between Kiev and Vienna, um, histories of people, ideas and objects in circulation and motion. And so as we organized a conference here, most of the participants were not from the field of Ukrainian studies, but we put them together in conversation with people who were right recognizing that this is a broader space that has exchanges and interlinkages that then reveal new things when we put them together and so i think what we can offer is an attractive model right we have a lot to be proud of in the field of ukrainian studies a lot of interesting ideas that people are naturally drawn to as we expand them out and push those institutional boundaries so thank you Thank you so much for your very comprehensive uh, presentation and for your insights and for pushing Ukrainian studies. That's that's great. And uh, now, as promised, uh, I've prepared sort of uh, short provocative questions for each of you just to, to warm up the discussion, to kick up the discussion. And my first question in the framework of uh, uh, my being moderator goes to Ms. Alha. You mentioned in your presentation that very often during the work of uh, the activist from Russian Studies Ukraine was a failed state. Isn't it the right time to promote um, Russian Studies as a failed state from Ukrainian side? Thank you very much for your provocative question. I think that it can be asked in the category of rhetoric questions. But in order for this to to be perceived in this manner, we have to make further subjectivization of Ukraine. We can't just say that Russia failed state, but we need to present a range of reasons for that. We know that academic environment is really inclined to and is actually working with facts with analysis of facts and taking like different categories and making drawing certain conclusions we won't be any different from our neighbors if we will use just the propaganda methods and we will just say that russia is a failed state but we aim at showing strong sides of ukraine and we want to show what kind of state we were in the historical context where we are now so that nobody in the world ever doubts that ukraine is not just a subject on geopolitical map of the world but is also quite powerful country which can generate new content can generate new experience can give a lot of interesting spheres for studies and be that country where people would like to go to and to study. Uh, I would like also to react that Mr. Anton mentioned 
uh, and what is lacking to me in our discussions, we always talk about Ukrainian studies and we look abroad, we look somewhere in the other countries. Why Russia managed to so confidently promote Russian studies because the idea, let us say so, of the Russian world that they were promoting and they are promoting all over the world has deep ideological basics. It means that they have answers to all the questions. Let us speak honestly what were our discussions about for the last, latest like 5, 10, 20 years ago, who we are, what's our idea, how do we move on. It's not bad, but we were in the search for ourselves, in the search for our own identity, how to position ourselves inside and externally. But when we are talking about Ukrainian studies, they cannot go just as an element and we can not think that the scientists and researchers abroad, they will have their own vision. No, they have to take this from here. And they have a huge request, not only for financing. Let us say so, there is enough money in the world. The question is where the money is spent and what are the priorities. The issue is to get access to the sources of information. There are requests in order to have some kind of open databases, different databases, requests in order to start study Ukraine in the way we see Ukraine and for that we need our own Ukrainian academic environment and we also need to promote this because there is an open question when we start discussions with universities what did they say first of all we have academic autonomy you cannot tell us what and how we have to study and it's good it's right with a big respect it is so but at the same time we expect the ukrainian researchers themselves can produce the content that we can not only hear inside the country like discuss but also to share that abroad and be the initiators so actually how we see that for ourselves ukrainian universities have to be big ambassadors in the history of development opening and promotion of ukrainian studies not the state of ukraine as a separate authorities it can have some tools of support for example like certain vector but it has to go from inside so that it will be natural organic and Therefore, we want such discussions. We want to have them here. We want to have as many materials as possible. And in our material, we made a separate chapter where there are like useful materials that can be used by our colleagues from abroad. As a President Fund uh, GovUA, you can find Ukrainian studies that contain this information, and we plan to update that. And it has to be not only there. It would be perfect to have as many such sources as possible. And when the researcher from any country of the world would like to, like, I'm interested, let me see. So he this researcher knows where to apply, where to look for this information, because what researchers do, first of all, they need sources of information. Like, give me, give me food for thought, right? Like tools and the possibility to find this information. Therefore, it's such a wide field for activity that it is pushing us not only from external side but also from internal side i won't like it to sound as if we are trying the guilty one but it seems to me that the war just showed us everything and we can see the whole picture and now we just need to analyze make our right decisions and move on in this context it would be perfect for each subject to take their part of responsibility and start moving properly and later on it will be much easier believe me and we won't have to somehow state that russia is a failed state of your Papers uh, which was described in the Ukraine in the 60s, 80s uh, years of the last century was named uh, the birth of Ukrainian dissident. If you write an article right now, what would, how would you name it? What's being born in Ukraine right now and what are the attributes of the new Ukrainian scholars, uh, new Ukrainian studies? 
The floor is yours. I cannot hear you. Sorry, 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 sorry. I forgot to turn the microphone on. Uh, uh, this is a very difficult question to um, answer, actually. Um, I, I don't know, but uh, surely, I mean, the, uh, the situation today looks more like the rebirth of a whole nation in Ukraine, not just of dissidents or just a part, but I think that there are a lot of similarities between the 60s uh, and, 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 and nowadays, uh, even in my, I, I did an interview with, um, uh, okay, this is perhaps, uh, not about the, the, the topic of this conference, but um, um, uh, I did an interview with Lina Kostenko who says that uh, the best of the Ukrainian nation comes out in the difficult moments and she saw a lot of similarities between what was going on in the uh, Soviet Ukraine in the 60s and then with the Orange Revolution and with the uh, Revolution of Dignity and even, uh, and even uh, nowadays. What I wanted to say is actually uh, I would like to um, agree totally with what uh, Catherine uh, and perhaps also Anton said before about the structure that we should give to the international initiatives of the uh, Ukrainian Institute uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, uh, I totally agree that it is, uh, from my point of view, absolutely, uh, uh, I mean, hopeless is we think that uh, uh, the whole world is going to uh, inaugurate new centers of Ukrainian studies and uh, new courses dedicated only to Ukraine as a, as a, as a nation. Uh, what we have to think, we have to think in terms of examples, of modules, of uh, phenomena that are characterizing the Ukrainian case that you can use to explain other phenomena, other examples outside Ukraine. For example, I mean, uh, in Italy, uh, even a, 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 a renowned, world-renowned historian like Andrea Graziosi is not teaching anything like uh, Ukrainian or even Soviet history. It's just teaching modern history. And what you do, for example, what I do with my work that I study public, is, I, I teach public history and history of nationalism is taking the Ukrainian case as a case that the students study, they understand how this phenomenon works and then they apply what they have learned with the Ukrainian studies, for example, for studying the Italian uh, case or so on and so forth. So the, I, I really agree that, I mean, Thinking in terms of expanding our fields, we have to think in terms of uh, what can we find useful for people not studying Ukrainian studies. Uh, and that will, I mean, open the door for other people coming to Ukraine and to the uh, Ukrainian uh, case to look for explanations, to look for uh, examples uh, for uh, comparisons with what they are studying. And so um, this, of course, may be a little difficult on the, uh, let's say, the level of the uh, collaboration, bureaucratic collaboration. I mean, uh, as I was uh, talking uh, earlier with some uh, members of the Ukrainian Institute sometimes, uh, like making an agreement with an association of Ukrainian studies is difficult. You need to do that with uh, uh, an institution that is not that voluble, like uh, an association. So also uh, it's perhaps easier to propose uh, an agreement, an international agreement with the university if you are not only focused on Ukraine, but if you are trying to develop uh, uh, a, a broader uh, uh, topic, a broader, uh, a broader question. It was the same with uh, our, for example, conference on Chernobyl. If we wanted to do a conference only on Chernobyl and the consequences in the, let's say, uh, Zhitomir and Kyiv region, perhaps it would be very difficult to find funding for that. If you frame that very same question, but in a way like uh, uh, Chernobyl is a, a cesura for the global history, for uh, environmental and so on and so forth, it's very easy to find subjects that are willing to funding this project and to come to the conference and listen to it. So I, I totally agree with what uh, Catherine and uh, I, I think also um, uh, Anton in his um, uh, in, the, in his um, uh, presentation set. So.
Sorry for not really answering the question. Thanks. Thank you so much, Simon. So the next question to you, Mr. Anton, it will be related to it's, it's Ms. Olga's interview quote. So in one of the interviews, you mentioned that soon many Ukrainians will return to Ukraine, those who graduated from Western universities, and they can bring this tradition to Ukraine. Uh, Anton, once you wrote that and you were called a researcher in exile, you know, um, maybe we you should not return. Maybe while staying in exile, you can bring some fresh blood, Ukrainian blood, to the foreign studies, or like you know. No, it's it's a horrible question. You you need to do both, but it's it's an individual choice. It's a matter of choice. I know right now so many stories when Ukrainians abroad are promoting Ukrainian Ukrainian culture, and even that was my destiny. When the war started, I was the person. I I was just. Horrified. I was telling my colleagues, you know, colleagues from American universities who study, who from the Russian studies, I told them, and they know Russian culture and history very well, but they know nothing of Ukrainian. And I tried to tell about it. If in this context we take those people who left as ambassadors, it's okay. It's human life. We can't invite someone or for someone to return, but I yes, I do hope that people with certain ex experience of staying in Western institutions, cooperating with those, they feel they know what democracy is in opposition to Ukrainian uh, bureaucracy. They can bring these elements of proper academic and uh, extra academic life. It, it, this should happen. We have to change it. This is this is this is about us. This is about changes in the ability, the ability of being more open. But in my opinion, you can stay abroad. You can do a lot for Ukraine there as well, and for the foreign audience, you can carry out researches and be very useful. It depends, of course. Okay, Anton, thank you. The following you've mentioned your project document in Ukraine, and uh, now I ask you for advice. What would you advise to those who want to document Ukraine now? It's an extremely important question, and so I can tell you what we see here at the IWM is that we think that this is going to have to be driven by people's expertise before the war. Right. So you're going to have to. So this is why what we're doing is supporting historians who, are, for example, are experts on the Second World War and the Holocaust, who are bringing that ex expertise to bear when they're gathering sources. Now, we are supporting sociologists who are continuing to do opinion polling during the war. We're supporting artists who have brought their experiences of reflection, of bringing interpretation to events as they're doing that. So every person in Ukraine and also every Ukrainian who's been displaced abroad has some insight into this war, into this war of destruction, into this genocidal war, and they can make a contribution to documenting it from that position of expertise. Um, can I pivot real quick and jump off of something that um, Simone and, and Anton were saying here? What I think is really important for us to figure out, and this is a real challenge, is how, on the one hand, to incorporate Ukraine into these bigger discussions without it becoming superficial knowledge, right? So we have to build the true expertise that then allows people to bring it into these. Because I understand completely if the fear is that there is going to be a piggybacking onto Ukrainian questions that comes because it's now a trendy topic, right? And so that's why the work to build this foundational expertise is also going to be crucial. So I just wanted to make sure that like, we all do recognize that that's also vital here. Thank you so much. Now we have plenty of questions in Zoom. We have a lot of questions in Zoom. We have so many questions in Zoom, but first I'd like to give this opportunity to our audience to ask questions. Valeri. Thank you so much for this opportunity to ask questions. Definitely question more to Olha and Anton, I guess, right now. So uh, I googled it a little bit. I found out that in 2022, Duolingo, the service, uh, 
offering Ukrainian course. 1.3 million people started learning Ukrainian. Whoa, is that a lot or a little? We can discuss that. 8 billion people in the world, they may not be a lot, but yeah. But much more comparing to 2021. Many people know us because of the conflict, of unfortunately, and what we're doing. But this is a window of opportunities. How do you think? If uh, okay, we saw the map presented by Miss Nadia today. Africa is like a white spot, Middle East white spot, India gray spot. Let's say, what should we do to make ourselves attractive? Uh, what are the magnets to promote Ukrainian studies in the world right now? Not for those who know us, who love us, the liberal world. Yeah, for those regions where it's hard, but we have to. Okay. <laughs> This was Mr. Valery Kravchenko from MFA. Please, ladies and gentlemen, introduce yourselves. Okay, Olga, thank you so much. And we have an answer to that question. We, we are working on that. How? Uh, Ukraine is a very multicultural country. And when we spoke about Ukrainian studies and Crimean Tatar studies, it says that we have definitely great bridges to link us with other states. In those cases, including those cases, sorry for saying that, where we have to use context, let's say, like for the Muslim world states, we have Crimean Tatar studies and we can tell about Ukrainian situation, which may be um, like why they need to stand for us because there is some religious and cultural aspect we may promote. We can approach the Muslim world via Crimean Tatar studies. African countries, many foreign students are from Africa, by the way, and they studied in Ukraine and they study in Ukraine. They go back to their countries after they graduate and they shape the policy. We have so we have many friends among these people, friends of Ukraine, those who are more or less uh, um, positively uh presenting ukraine and we even have some of them as like decision makers at their national levels these are very good entry points uh for us to understand how and what can we give them how can we be interesting and useful to these people okay third thing why we started developing these cases separately which allow us to see how specific areas are developing or how we are handling the challenges to have some uh, pool for discussion. We don't we don't force people. Okay, start loving Ukraine. Let's discuss first. Let's take the situation. Let's analyze it from a different standpoint. And we offer to um, take it at level university, at level of professors and students. Analyze the topic, discuss the topic, and generate some interest. Like this. This is a long term game. <laughs> so we have to give. A piece by piece, drop by drop, give an alternative vision for the processes that take place because when people even don't know enough about the country, they don't have enough facts for them, it's quite hard to understand. Like, so they ha for the half of their history, we had some good connections with Russia, they gave us money. Now you come and say Russia is bad, we have to take your side. Why? We, we even have these cases. So, to answer why, we have to promote and nurture step by step with these discussions as well these are like small pieces of the puzzle this definitely will be effective i'm i admire so much how ukrainian institute is greatly is promoting cultural diplomacy i really want educational diplomacy to go with this trend as well. This is a separate layer, which is still not working effectively. It's it's a big pool of opportunities. We can do it. This is really relevant for Middle East, for Asia, for India, like for all of those who are a little bit more skeptical towards us. Like this is the vision. And uh, with embassies, of course, we really want and we will work, okay? If someone would like to add something, okay, then uh, uh, do we have any questions right now in this hall? Yes, I guess we do. Please, who are you? Irina Bohinska, Donetsk National University, named after Vasily Stus. It's not a question, but a reflection, very brief. Um, truly, I'd like to say that really great bunch of speakers we have today at this panel because 
uh, we managed to get various perspectives and various uh, ideas, and I do support the state um, perception of Ukrainian studies as a tool to oppose, as a struggle tool. Yes, this is great, but we have to stick to balance. We have to get the balance. The academic uh, perspective presented by Anton, it's a little bit closer to me because I'm a teacher, I'm a professor at the university, and uh, we talk, talked a lot about Russian studies and uh, Ukraine dissolved in that I don't see a problem in it, you know, because I'm convinced that 99% of research in Russian studies, this is propaganda of low quality. And when you tell about foreign policy models, when you speak of the Russian Federation models, nothing can be proposed to a student as a high quality research or survey, you know, and uh, we also have to get these high quality research from Ukrainian studies as well. So this segment definitely has to evolve. And Catherine's vision is really what I like because we do not need just to fix on Ukraine, but showing Ukraine in a broader, bigger perspective as a part of it. And by the way, I um, applied for non-residential um, grant in the Institute because I do feel, I do feel that I can contribute to it. Yeah. And, uh, how can I contribute to the general context of Ukrainian struggle and promotion? It's about reputation and foreign image and stimulus for us, for our science to develop. And many, many things are there. Yeah, this this is my reflection. Thank you so much for the comment. Sirhi, you want to say something? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, one small remark from me, I guess, uh, especially in the context. We've touched upon so many issues today, including the attitude to Russia, the perception of Russia. It's really hard to formulate the Russian image, which would not be uh, threatening to us because so many things are there. We have to start thinking about it now, I, I guess. Maybe we can even give some sort of feeble signal, but it's hard to do. About the impulse, Ukraine right now is definitely affecting the foreign relations, affecting um, many people on individual level. And... Uh, this Ukrainian case's impact, this, this, this may become a certain impetus or impulse which may be presented as an element for expansion. Question to Anton. How can you commercialize history? Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, this is a very provocative thing that it, it bugs me, you know, like, how can that... It's like a bee in the bonnet, you know. I really want to have your clarification. I won't leave this place as long as I get one, okay? Uh, it's not what I see. It's happening. On the one hand... Uh, yeah, but microphone is... Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the one... On the other hand, history is a battlefield. We can see it. You know, history, especially public, you know, when we disseminate knowledge beyond academic community in non-academic ways history is becoming a tool it's commercializing as history itself is generating certain products to sell b it becomes an element of economy we can see it today as an element of propaganda uh, implemented specifically and c history as an attraction um, it may give or not give profit, like briefly, <laughs> because we can have a separate discussion for it. Uh, I will advertise it. In one of the big supermarkets, you can buy even some additional, um, I don't know, tokens, cards with Ukrainian history characters. This is commercializing. We're commercializing history like that. Okay, thank you, Anton. Uh, I have a couple of questions from the Zoom, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll read it aloud. One question from Ina Volosevich. 
She says thank you to Ukrainian University for interesting research. She wants us to answer. How frequently Ukrainian and Russian studies merge? And what is the expertise of Ukrainian studies specialists? Because in Germany, there was a special research made for Ukrainian studies by the InfoSapiens company. Another clarifying question from Ina. So the informal merging, informal, uh, this informal merging of Ukrainian and Russian centers, like how Russians talk about Ukrainians. Do we have these cases? How it's working? Do they change the policy? Well, there was a partial answer in the research. Maybe some of the someone of the speakers would like to add, please. Probably I will comment a bit. Actually, the situation right now is that if we look at the map of the world, of the academic environment, like the Ukrainian Institute presented, and we see how many Ukrainian studies, uh, it would be also very interesting to see about the Russian studies. And from what we see right now and what we are actively advocating and communicating to our foreign partners, abroad it's separation so we are separating ourselves and we are saying that ukrainian studies have to go beyond russian studies because uh, miss nina mentioned correctly that nowadays ukraine is studied via the like prism and i mentioned in many cases via russian studies eastern european studies slavic studies and in all the three components in this or other way there is Russian narrative and their point of view to Ukraine about like how many Russian scientists are showing are representing Ukraine. I can't name the exact number, but it's it's there in different extents. And here is also the question to us because Ukrainian researchers who can somehow somehow oppose this we don't have such a lot of scientists and the situation changed nowadays and we hope that soon there will certain change and I can name already some examples like recently last week we had a discussion with the University St. Andrews um, University in Scotland where uh, the prince and princess of uh, Wales and uh, they graduated this and many noble um, um, noble participants were also graduating and they wanted to promote these studies and the same situation is in Oxford Cambridge and others we are talking only about Britain and we can make we can also name some examples from other countries. So from one side, they have intention. From other side, they need to understand that indeed it's important, it is supported, and we are involved in this process as much as possible. But I would like to mention that this can be done by a lot of people. Those who understand the importance of this topic, they might be ambassadors. It's not necessary that only from the fund of the president this position is mentioned or from the office of the president. It might be the position of academic environment and clarification. Why is it important? And actually, how this separation should take place. So if really briefly, yeah, we have a problem. Yeah, we have some progress. And I think that in the nearest time, the picture will change. It doesn't mean that we don't have to believe the illusions that Russian studies would disappear, but uh, we are saying that Russia had certain humanitarian policy and they will continue pouring money into studying Russian studies. But the thing is that it they should be like ashamed. We should be ashamed in order to like associate ourselves somehow with Russia. And then it will become clear that we can look at the same issue that they were promoting from totally different aspect and via different prism. Thank you. Ms. Olha, I have a lot more questions from Zoom, but we are really brief in time because we already uh, took more time. Uh, I truly hope that we will fit into the 
I hope that we will fit into the 10 minutes. We had some problems at the beginning of the presentation, but we have less and less time. So probably we won't be able to answer all of the questions, but I would like to um, ask uh, the question from Mr. Uh, Sharipov to Mr. Simone. He is interested whether you plan to develop in Italy studies of climate in the context of Ukrainian studies. And he's writing that Italians, especially um, Italians from uh, Genoa, they were in the um, Crimea before the Moscow representatives came there. So if you are interested in studying the Crimea, so the floor is yours. Thank you for this question. Actually, I would say that the, in the Italian university, we actually have a sector that is dedicated to Turkish and similar studies. So perhaps there is some specialists that could do that. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, even if we have a lot of people working in this field, we don't have specialists who are studying uh, Crimea or what was going on in, in Crimea in the last few years. And there are only specialists uh, uh, coming from the Russian or Soviet studies that are studying and publishing even now uh, new histories of, uh, of Crimea and so on and so forth. So this is like uh, a problem for the Italian um, uh, uh, perspective because, I mean, these facts, these events are uh, explained to the Italian public and to the students at the university only from a very uh, Russian-centered uh perspective so uh we, this is something that we still have to develop in a different um, uh, and better way thank you for this comment and a uh, few more questions uh, one goes to either one question from us Olha. And uh, people are asking whether you can explain in more details what can be offered by uh, Ukraine to um, the Latin America as a narrative um, in order to somehow cope with Western uh, policy. So one uh, narrative for the African countries and Latin America. I think I briefly answered this question from the point of view of narrative with Africa. We can and we have to talk about agro-security. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, it's really, again, it's the business issue and it's the issue that is really relevant for them nowadays. And everybody felt that when the ports were not accessible and we had this grain crisis. So we can mention this aspect and we can mention why it happened so and what can be different. With Latin America, it's a bit more difficult. But let us say so. They are sitting on the needle, um, oil and gas, and it's a bit difficult to talk about this because they have a lot of the inflows, but we need to try different aspects with them. I don't have a certain answer right now, but we are testing like what they can react to. So it's either the issue of uh, energy security, what can be relevant for them, and just to see wider perspective of what can improve their economic aspects because let us say so the topic of democracy development are not that relevant for them right now i will speak just uh, roughly so nothing personal just business and we need to um, take business topics that are relevant for them and what can be offered by ukraine as an alternative to what russia does Olha, i cannot um stop myself uh, from uh, advertising myself because we are launching the program to Latin America. So let us do this together. And the last question, probably I won't ask it, um, taking into account the lack of time, but I would like to, it's Ostap Krivdik, it's my friend and um, colleague, and I think it's more to Simone, but if you have this information, then also for you. Ostap is interested in the issue of necessifying uh, um, Meaning those who are having the symbols suggest a very simple challenge.
So this is like a typical question at any uh, conference about Ukraine. Uh, there's always somebody uh, asking about uh, Nazis in Ukraine and uh, uh, the relationship with uh, uh, with the past and with the collaboration between Ukrainians or Ukrainian nationalism and uh, uh, and, and and Hitler and the Nazis. Well, I think that the best option here is first of all tell the truth, uh, and I have to say that we have examples of telling the truth about what was going on during the Second World War. And this is one of the reasons why we decided to translate uh, Yaroslav Gritsa's book into Italian, because uh, if you want to address the issues of like uh, Nazis in Ukraine, you have to uh, have a good uh, like work of uh, uh, history craft uh, to present. And uh, the other Thing that we have to do is also to explain that uh, the whole history of Ukraine after the Second World War until now, in order to explain uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the meaning and the changes and the development and the evolution of the Ukrainian national movement in the following years, also uh, to uh, make people understand uh, why even if, at least from my point of view, perhaps uh, uh, Stepan Bandera was not, uh, a, let's say, a supporter of democracy. Nevertheless, he is now perceived by Ukrainians as a symbol of the fight for democracy. Uh, this may be difficult uh, to do, but this is something that we try to do. Uh, when we talk about this and uh, also when we are like asked questions about the uh, Azov battalions or, 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 or things like that, what you have to do is just um, tell the truth. Um, I don't know if this was the, the question, but I think that this is the only uh, answer that I can give to it. Thank you, Simon. That's a great answer. I think if you don't know what to do, tell the truth. And uh, I think it might work with Ukraine and it might work with Russia as well. And uh, And here probably we should stop already because uh, we took like 15 minutes from the coffee break, which is not acceptable. I would like to thank to our speakers, Catherine and Simon and Ms. Oliha and um, to you, Mr. Anton, for participation in this wonderful session. And it seems to me that the discussion was really interesting. It seems to me that uh, we made a good foundation for the discussion during the next second session. And it seems to me that all speakers from today, they deserve applauses. Thank you very much. No shows. OK. So I. We'll use the microphone and say to everyone in the hall, good afternoon. And to everyone still enjoying the coffee break, you can actually take your coffees and move here and all the participants joining us online. I'm telling you that we start with the second panel of today's conference or discussion or conversation, whatever. We'll see what it will be. And today, in the second part, we'll talk about delivery in Ukrainian studies. But Let's be frank, delivery related directly to academic uh, activities, so we'll, we'll continue talking about the research. So we'll start with a short introduction. I'm Ivan Hanza, and I'm Academic Director of the Public Policy and Governance Program at Kiev School of Economics. I am the PhD in politology, but I have some interest to history and Ukrainian studies as well. So. Um, we have with us today the only representative who managed to join us offline, Mr. Martin Kisley. He's a lecturer at the Department of History, National University of Kimmo Hill Academy. He's also a PhD. He's the fresh limited PhD <laughs> because recently has defended his paper on trauma and uh, the history of Crimean Tatars. And we will talk about Crimean Tatar studies. But to the broader circle of his interests, these include migration, memory, 
memory uh, related to trauma, as we understand it, identity and oral history. Uh, recently, Martin has published an interesting paper on peculiarities of how to carry out the oral research. We speak of Crimean Tatars, but anyway, some results can be taken for the methodology in general. We also have other two participants. I'm looking there. I hope they see me. We have them online. First of all, partially a colleague of Mr. Martin, Irina Driha. She is a senior fellow, Department of Near and Middle East, uh, Krimsky Institute of Oriental Studies. And she is an expert in uh, Turkish studies. And among many of her papers, there is a chapter on uh, emergence of Turkish languages in Ukraine. So it was published by Brill Publishing House. If you are into Oriental studies, you know about this publishing house. So greetings, Irina. And uh, we also have Miss Yulia Yurchuk. Uh, our paths crossed somehow, I guess. <laughs> so it's a big pleasure for me to introduce you. So Miss Yulia, she's an associate professor of Department of Historical and Contemporary Studies. Uh, she's an author of so many papers. She has a huge number of publications related to memory policy and commemorative practices in Ukraine and uh, Ms. Yurchuk, she studied the issue of uh, historical language, the Victory Day uh, significance for Ukraine, especially after 2014 mnemonic battles around Ukrainian nationalist organization. And I just assume, like, if we assume where the discussion may turn, what will be the most fruitful? To use the post-colonial perspective, which is really which is also one of the interests in Ms. Yurchuk's pool of interest. So we gathered a big powerful team and if I had an opportunity to present the fourth participant the team would be really even more convincing but Kyiv life is about that. We have blackouts not only in Kyiv and the fourth person still cannot join us. If he does of course he'll get the word Mr. Kulik, Professor Kulik he is, we may say, a veteran of intellectual war, you know. So, colleagues, taking these updates into account, I'll tell you about the agenda, like what I offer for us, how to move. I do hope we can start with this two-round debut. One of these two rounds, each of you will have five, seven minutes for initial statements and I want these two rounds first to relate a situation uh, the pre-war situation for Ukrainian studies and then we'll talk on what changes were caused by the war I tell this for you just to structure your thoughts like what we'll discuss after these two rounds are over we can go to free discussion we'll get questions from Zoom, from offline audience. So, to pass the floor to you, because I'm the usurper. I, I, I took the floor. I don't give the mic to anyone right now. So, coming to the conversation itself, I will give my own assumption that Ukrainian studies delivery, Ukrainian studies delivery, it suffers from two structural discrepancies. First one is the resource discrepancy because resources are allocated to Russian studies, transnational studies. Much more of these are allocated comparing to ones allocated to Ukrainian studies. And on the other hand, additionally to that discrepancy, we have a political discrepancy and uh, inequity. So, and at the crossroads of these, we have such issues like what students do pick when they uh, compose their curricula in many universities, you have actually a chance to pick. What endowments are going for? Uh, in what departments they hire new people? So it depends on resources and quite often the answer is unsatisfactory for Ukrainian studies progress. The discrepancies which uh, oppose Ukrainian studies, these are politicized issues like what is really prestigious to study Russian studies or Ukrainian? What paradigms are you can be used to explain political and historical reality? Yeah, in Ukraine we have like a 
civil war, this is one paradigm, or this is transnational insurgency, or like, what is that? Foreign aggression, external aggression. So what is relevant to study about Ukraine? We know that quite often researchers and colleagues will tell they focused on big issues like corruption, nationalism, fascism, failed state, ignoring all the important things and better things when it comes to Ukrainian reality, which deserved to get some attention. So this is the framework. I do hope you'll have a chance to present your statements and we will start with Ms. Yurchuk. I need to talk to the camera. So Yulia, good afternoon. Uh, your experience, uh, you are a researcher who is wonderfully integrated in f Western science and Western academia, and uh, your experience is peculiar. You're a person uh, located in Sweden, special educational system is there, special relations between public area and academia. So, the challenges you faced, did they define your academic and teacher's trajectory. Mnemonic battles in Ukraine. Was it easy with to study that issue or not? The last thing. Did you observe certain colonial optics when it came to Ukraine? Okay, please. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to see you all, even like in this online environment. Uh, this is definitely a very big multilateral question. I'll start with the research, then I'll go to teaching. Sweden is definitely a very specific country, I think, like the whole Scandinavia. Uh, there's nothing like in the US, Ukrainian studies. It doesn't exist there, like certain centers uh, just focusing on Ukraine specifically or some issues related purely to Ukraine. We have only three in Sweden. We have three centers handling the Eastern European issues and uh, Ukrainian studies are there, but it doesn't mean that Ukraine is handled only by those who work in these three centers. In your introduction, you have everything about these centers. I will not give the titles, but the specificities that not necessarily necessarily have to be there in the centers to handle Ukraine. I. Uh, I am a part of the depart history department. I have no relation to those centers, but I do work with Ukrainian issues. In my courses, I deliver a lot about Ukraine. These are still not the courses which have direct connection to Ukraine, but some bachelor's or master's programs. There are no such programs in Sweden which are completely dedicated to Ukraine or Ukrainian studies. But mm, we have more extended programs where the courses are a part of it and Ukrainian courses may be a part of it. It depends on who is delivering the course. For example, when I deliver a global history course, there is a huge space to mention Ukraine and to mention Soviet uh, past, post-Soviet transformations. For example, I um, also uh, deal with the memory policy in Sweden, they call it the study of the use of past and historians do that. So I had a couple of courses dedicated specifically to uh, me memory policy and I delivered a lot about Ukraine there. So these always have been like entry points into Ukrainian studies via my own, through my own interest and if there is an opportunity or space in the university, if there is a course, a program, and then you actually uh, use your interests to enter that pool, and if you want to, d if you really can deliver it properly. So what I noticed, because of because of these like theoretical framework or chronological limits or even discipline limits, it's 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 the easiest thing to use this framework or limits because formulating a big comprehensive Ukrainian program, it's hard, but when you enter an existing one, an existing course with your optics, uh, 
even when we talk about global history I'm and we are telling about the colonialism and we are talking about different types of colonialism and here this optics perfectly shows Ukrainian situation history and even when we are talking about the policy of memory also it's very wonderful basics to show how the colonial optics can explain situation in Ukraine with the memorials with the uh, memory policy and actually via those courses we are attracting attention of students who actually maybe never even thought about that Ukraine is has such an interesting situation that it's such a country where you can study a lot talk a lot n without even expecting that actually I have interest to this particular region and this is some something that I can see on the example of many of my students we begin the course they have no idea what it's going to be they are coming for the course on global history or the course on the memory policy and then we end this course and they say it was incredibly interesting and we never could have thought that something similar was happening for example in Ukraine or in Baltic countries I take examples from what I know best and what I'm doing so they are just become really interested in that and it just helps them see a lot of things that they never thought about and when they start saying that it's so close to us meaning to Estonia you can just take a boat and overnight you are in Estonia it's a very popular road so Ukraine is just two hours on plane so they are just rethinking about the region the students themselves and it seems to me that it's very interesting experience indeed and for me as a teacher who is working in a really like Swedish um, Institute with Swedish students all the education is in Swedish and here are such horizons uh, new topics for students uh, they are not new and they are obvious for me but how they are changing their thinking it's very interesting to see Thank you very much. So we can make the first uh, interesting moment, let's call it transnational pass to Ukrainian studies when students are coming to, let us say so, the history of climate and then they learn that the biggest desert in Europe is in Ukraine that correspondingly how it impacts the climate and then we can connect the story of uh, Turkish tribes and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, it's a very interesting information, a very interesting um, thing that we found out. So we will move to our next speaker. We will talk to Ms. Um, Irina, I guess I will ask you first about your personal experience because as far as I know you were involved directly to opening the Department of uh, Ukrainian Studies uh, in the um, University of Istanbul. So um, I'm really interested whether in your opinion there were some kind of Orientalism, reverse Orientalism towards Ukrainian studies, whether there was this estrangement to the subject that you had to teach to your students. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for invitation, for the possibility to speak. I see the participants, the friends whom we already know. I would like to greet you all sincerely. Nowadays, I am in Turkey. And again, and Karen, again, we are working um, on places, so to say, and I'm really sorry that I could not be present in Ukraine in person in Kyiv, and I couldn't participate in person, but uh, creation of any Ukrainian studies in the uh, countries who these um, challenges are well known, we had the same, but the most um, important thing that Ukraine as a state has to be considered as independent uh, international player and when such conditions happened it became possible to open the Ukrainian studies as uh, the separate discipline and second precondition is the wave of growth of touristic 
flow to both sides. You know that millions of uh, Ukrainians are flowing to uh, Turkey, and it's the statistics which was growing annually, and there was high demand to language and culture and so on. So the third precondition may be the most important and probably the uh, most visual one. It's a really long term and hard time for negotiating with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, especially with the ministries. Uh, ministers of education, ambassadors, and um, the consuls. So with these efforts, we managed in 2013 to announce uh, this opening. And in March, there was Lilia Hranevich, uh, the minister of that time. And it started working. Three years I spent in the uh, Istanbul Ukrainian studies. It was a period of really intense um, contacts, first of all, making contacts, uh, administrative contacts and others. That was actually my university. I knew that perfectly. I've been studying there as a student, but everything uh, was uh, from the scratch because we were talking about interinstitutional and not personal uh, connections. So correspondingly, when we were going there, we had some predictions, of course, prognosis, who are going to be our students, so what motivation they're going to have. Some of them were true and some of them were not. So, for example, out of those that um, were not true, we thought that there will be children um, of um, wives who are Ukrainian who will give their children to Ukrainian studies, but we had none of those. With time, they started like giving their children to Ukrainian studies in order to bring back their culture and so on. But at first, those were people who had no families and no historical connection to Ukraine. We were hoping for active Ukrainian communities and Ukrainian diaspora and um, crime tatters not much and even till today we don't have a lot of such people so it was not the leading tendency when we were entering there was a lot of information uh, noise so to say we gave a lot of interviews where we've been um, saying that we of course promise quality because uh, that's first time in history first specialist in history uh, possibilities for employment, um, good quality from both countries, both states, and um, the possibility to show yourself an administrative uh, work and so on. So we had the first graduation this year. So we graduated the first birds, so to say, who were having diplomas in Ukrainian studies and the teaching. Ukrainian teaching was brought to international level for Ukraine, which constantly, in, even in the framework of the uh, cathedra of uh, Ukrainian languages, we were competing with Russia, Poland, and so on. We had to offer our students, indeed, such you know motivation, huge motivation, in order for them not only undertake the Ukrainian studies, but also to stay there. So the students, they were competing. Those who failed to um, get the right rating for the Slavic countries in order not to uh, waste one year, they said that when they saw uh, this uh, possibility, they took this course. But then they said that when they saw the support from the embassies and from the authorities and everyone, they decided to stay in this course. So now I would like to mention that uh, we have among these Ukrainian um, researchers in Istanbul are the most active uh, Turkish uh, students. So first of all, Indeed, we had not only to create uh, this Department of Ukrainian Studies, but also to develop this Department of Ukrainian Studies, that is to continue supporting and also to prove with annual steps that we are exclusive and this is exclusiveness that Ukraine and Turkey as countries are offering to those early birds. It was possible to do this in a really different way, as I mentioned already, uh, attractiveness uh, of um, 
books and educational sets that we were providing to our students, attractiveness of uh, grants uh, and in programs. Indeed, the, we had these programs, exchange programs, and our students were in ivano Frankivsk in KU University, in Lviv University, and in 2019, there was no exchange programs in KU that were done. So, as I mentioned already, that the student who will be properly sent to Ukraine there, they will get the proper education, they will come back and they will like our country for the rest of their lives. But for three years already, there is a growth of specialists um, who never saw the realities of our country. They never uh, knew the realities of our country. Of course, we have war nowadays. And indeed, we are really afraid that it will have a huge demotivation sense. Uh, the second issue that we have, we have eight uh, alumnis, and um, there is statistics about those eight alumnis. Uh, not a single one of them works according to their specialty. Not a single one of them found job. So these are people who really like Ukraine. Those are Ukrainian researchers, Ukrainian scientists. They either went to the UN or IOM in order to help Ukrainian migrants. But these projects, they will end up or they already ended up. And they these alumni, they are left with no job. They, are, uh, they want to undertake the master's degree in Istanbul University, but we don't have the master's degree yet for Ukrainian studies. So they um, have uh, to uh, enter Polonist studies, but because they don't want, uh, want to undertake like Russian studies. So now they are either unemployed or they changed uh, their specialist specialty and they became like dictators and somebody are trying to provide their um, services as uh, uh, translators. But um, again, it's not of high demand. So now we have quite um, not a good tendency by like yeah, we created this, but it's much harder to maintain this. And one more promise so when we created Ukrainian studies was that, OK, our dear friends, nowadays Ukraine is not the biggest like, country in the world, is not the most famous country in the world, but it's actively developing. And we don't have to forget that we have colossal diasporas in Canada and um, we have colossal Ukrainian interests and centers really powerful and prestigious in the EU countries. We have Ukrainian Studies Institute and our big dream, our plans were to improve cooperation, institutional cooperation so that our so that our elements have the possibility to specialize. We didn't manage to establish such contacts. We didn't manage to promote our students, although it was really desired, especially nowadays when Ukraine, yeah, when Ukraine is having such a motivation, so as Canada, Europe, uh, USA, and create the studies with them, if another, it would be really, really important. And the last thing I would like to mention, we will talk about commercialization, all these wonderful offers that nowadays are there, and they are working perfectly in American market. We mean Ukrainian Catholic University, summer school, I mean, um, some offers from Viv University, they are not working in Turkey. Why? Because um, we have on the state level, this Polonistic level, and it's financed by the state from the state budget. Therefore, any commercial offers, right? It's forbidden to have those. Only interstate programs of academic exchange are allowed, free of charge programs. Because 
uh, here they are paying like 300, 500 euros for the summer school. But here with the, like private initiative of their own cause, they can go. But uh, the authorities don't recommend to do that for students because we don't have the agreement. Therefore, there are no guarantee or insurance. So only free of charge state programs should be there like these initiatives. Unfortunately, the connection is not very well. So, unfortunately, well, the state should pay more attention to creation of these products. I know. Well, we may take this separately, the Crimean Tatar studies, maybe. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for this very extended answer. And I think we, of what you said, we can get some important lesson. I started with these two structural discrepancies. Ukrainian studies are today resource and political discrepancy. So in this case study that you present, we can clearly see that when there's a growth of resources because of the trade or migration flows and the interest between two countries is nurtured, it creates political background for this political discrepancy to be partially off and then at the state level to create studies. So it's really interesting. Um, can this recipe work in other cases? Maybe we'll talk about it. Okay, really from Istanbul, we're now coming from Bakhchisarai. Mr. Kisli, Crimean Tatar studies, we can consider these to be a part in Ukrainian study puzzle. Not often, quite often it's ignored, you know? So not noticed. What is similar with the experience of our colleagues? What is peculiar? Problems and perspectives of this area. Thank you for the wonderful question. Thank you, Ukrainian Institute, for wonderful research. Thank you for this unique opportunity to be the only offline speaker in this panel. Crimean Tatar studies. First of all, we have to ask question if the patient is dead or in coma, because uh, we had some attempts, <laughs> many attempts, multiple attempts on how to on formulating these, shaping these Crimean Tatars as an area, institution area of research. We had different initiators for establishment of Crimean Tatar studies. Unfortunately, none of these attempts well, all these attempts failed. There was no specific result. In 2023, we can't state that result. No result with specific achievements. Why it happens like that? There are so many reasons for it, you know? And, uh, well, in the words of my colleagues, we, we spoke so much of inequality, discrepancy, post-colonial perspective. The problem is why these studies do not exist in Ukraine and since 1991, it's the discrepancy, the inequality problem. That's the reason why we still don't have Crimean Tatar studies. And the status that Crimean Tatar has received after returning to Crimea, lack of status, I mean, it's the lack of status. And what was the key optics re regarding Crimea and uh, our optics on Crimea and Crimean Tatars? For they, they stopped being a minority. Uh, for quite a long time, we thought of them, you know, of is one of national ethnic minorities living in Ukraine, inhabiting Ukraine just like Russians, sorry, Jews, Armenians, or any other ethnic group, whatever, Turks, it's not important. But this problem is rooted in that. A lot of discrepancies, a lot of inequality. Uh, Crimean Tatars, after they returned, the environment they lived in, when they tried to uh, the material aspect. It was not even about education or upbringing or shaping their own community of research, is creating their own centers. We had centers in Crimea, but maybe not that productive to generate studies where they could deliver that, you know. Uh, not something the research might come out of. After February 24th in Ukraine, we talk about a decolonization. This is a topic number one, and uh, the state decommunization policy established after 2014, uh, we can hear that they want to turn it into decolonization and change the imperial narratives, deconstruct them. It's ironic that 
Ukrainian Institute established and founded and basically finished the key part of work on Crimean Tatar history course by February 24th. On February 22nd, I guess, we sent the last texts, me and my colleagues, we did it to the online course in Crimean Tatar history course and uh, in spring we did it because in summer we published the course on the Udeni platform. Uh, the course is interesting. Why? Because for the first time it offers for this white public, it offers the history of Crimean Tatars actually for many people. There is an attempt to offer this history via the lens of the people themselves, Crimean Tatars, to push away this colonial aspect. In the list of authors, we can see this discrepancy, only a couple of Crimean Tatars names, a couple of those researchers, uh, only one professor from Turkey, other are Ukrainians. Of course, well, this course is not aimed to cover all those gaps, uh, created in 19th, 20th century during the independence period and it will not close the gaps we have after February 24th when we have to oppose Russian imperative uh, narrative, imperial narrative. The course is great, please go to Udemy, it's free of charge, the course I mean. It's 10 sections are there, 21 lecture, it offers the general context, Crimean history, uh, Crimean uh, people, so the annexation of Crimea is there as well. Separate chapter in colonial policy, Russian Empire in Crimea, and uh, 1917, the problem that was there, how it was put in imperial context, Eastern Imperial context, Soviet Union in Crimea, the status of Crimean taters. Uh, So, the shaping of Soviet uh, nation, as they call it, and deportation of Crimean Tatars. So, the intention to return, this is something that goes for every nation. People want to return if they can. And finally, they do. Eventually, they do. The course is closed the history, the Crimean Tatar history after 1991. Occupation of Crimea is there as well, a separate lecture. This course is not aimed to solve multiple tasks. This is a problem of all online courses. Just one hour 45 per each lecture. This is the duration. We can't cover all the gaps with it. After February 24th, I had Letters from North American universities and professors, they say we reveal this problem, but not enough of content, not enough of publications. Can you share something, what we can give to students? What can we deliver? Because we're not experts in that, they said. These are the people who've been dealing with Russian studies, and right now they open Ukraine, they reveal Ukraine, and they read, they read somewhere that it started not in 2022, but in 2014, they want to dig deeper. The only thing we can offer them this online course, they can disseminate between students and uh, a couple of books published by American researchers. So my colleagues asked me, by the way, to compile this book on Crimean Tatar history in English, but I can't pick any colleague to help me with that, actually. So. Um, speaking of the status of Crimean Tatar studies, we can describe these problems for so long. We've spoke today for so many times how to generate interest, how to attract students and researchers abroad, <coughs> why it should be interesting for them. It, it's clear why now it should be interesting because we have the crisis, the conflict, the war. Mm, Ukraine is always there on the agenda, in the news, and there is a window of opportunities we can use, but it will not always be like that. Uh, it's obvious that we have to find the ways on how to generate interest, how to, well, how, how to stimulate people out of that 
crisis context. The initiative must be placed on the researcher and professor. Not necessarily we need to have this territorial principle. The disciplinary principle is better. We can pick topics, disciplines, areas where Ukraine and Crimea have relation to where these are organically uh, well my papers are an organic part organic part of it by the way uh, I analyzed how Crimean Tatars returned to their motherland there is a big 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 area to study the migration uh, in the history of migration, a lot of attention is paid, by the way, to so-called reverse migration. But never, it was never about Crimean Tatars. There is an assumption that migrants cannot return. They assimilate, they root in new places, they are not interested. If it, these are political migrants, they don't expect anything at home. If labor migrants, they settle. If forced migration, they are prone to creating new motherlands, inventing new places there. Crimean Tatars are unique in that matter. We can create a new issue to study in the migration area and migration studies because Crimean Tatars did not invent a new motherland in Uzbekistan. They did not assimilate with Uzbeks who are Muslims as well. Um, they return. It's, it's about claiming the homeland. It's decolonization as it is, you know, and uh, the post-colonial studies, look at that. We can, like, um, tie it to so many things. And it's not even just about Ukrainian history. I think this way is the most productive. Thank you so much. Thank you. To me, it seems that with your reflections, Mr. Martin, you... Uh, you know, presented this overarching architecture to what Ms. Yulia said, and I offer us to think about this rupture or gap that the war brought. Again, another round where we may uh, respond to these ideas. What it led to, you all told me right now about the state of affairs, the challenges a discipline is facing, or you as a researcher, a professor, but the war, what did it change? Let's stay researchers. <laughs> Let's think about mechanisms first of all. What are the mechanisms which lead to changes? Did the war change something in how the grants are allocated? How the syllabi are written? How the sources are picked? Um, I just use my own perspective for it. I'm a teacher as well. And after February 24th, my American colleagues asked me, well, first of all, they asked me to deliver them a course about Ukraine. Only when you pick a specific optics, when you show how political regimes, nature in Russia and Ukraine differently affected our post-Soviet transit, or showing how the regime nature affected the announcement of war, we can make it clearer for them. But again, war, changed the attitude to Ukrainian studies in the aspects I can think of in my experience what mechanisms you revealed for yourself or would you like to show us okay Miss Yulia uh, let's keep the sequence okay well definitely the war changed everything I want to say but a lot and um, if we speak about grants honestly it's not clear still. In Sweden, there's such a specificity that the biggest grants and uh, the foundation, uh, they give these calls once a year. We will see if something changed in the grants maybe later, like in a year. But I wa what I want to say that after 2014, it was really obvious. It was, we saw it that uh, after annexation of Crimea and uh, word Donbass, um, Foundations give more money to study Ukraine, to study Ukrainian issues. Later, this interest in 2016, it faded significantly when it come, came to grants. Now it will be interesting to see what will change. And this window of opportunities, when some colleagues who never actually 
dealt with Ukraine, you know, they start diving into this. We saw that in 2014, and I think this is something we will observe after 2022. But the result will be clear and seen closer to the end of 2023. So if we take the delivery process, yeah? Uh, for example, in the biggest, the biggest course about Ukraine was delivered uh, by Stockholm University after 2014. They made the ad hoc course, which was named Ukraine yesterday and today. And in 2014, uh, there were approximately 200 students registered. It's really a lot. And then, and then this course was not popular. It was not delivered for a few years. And then in 2022, and spring already, again, it was renewed. And in the autumn, 100 students registered for that course. So. We'll see how it continues, but at the same time, for example, in uh, Lund University, they also formed the new course about Ukraine. It's not a big program, but it's a course. And it will be about the policy, memory policy and literature. So it will be more the humanitarian direction. And also at the same time, there was growth of interest and number of students who want to study Ukrainian language. Uh, so it was very noticeable because uh, till 2022, a Ukrainian language was taught in Hottenburg and since 2022 in Lundi and also in Stockholm University. And actually, there were like 40, 50 people registered for those courses. And it's a huge number of people who want to study Ukrainian. And in Stockholm University, there is a specific that Ukrainian language can be uh, studied by those who already know pretty well Slavic language, other Slavic language. So it's on a pretty high level. So there is interest. And if we look at this interest to in the language, which is growing with the request, uh, because many uh, Ukrainian women came here after February uh, 2022. We see that the very country, Sweden, they require a bigger number of interpreters and many courses. Um, like interpretation courses, they had requests to Ukrainian because those migration flows, they were impacting and they are still impacting this request and the country has to react somehow. And even it's just a personal experience. My daughter is 10 years old and we couldn't find the teacher of Ukrainian. Uh, via school, because Sweden gives to each person the right to study their uh, native language, the language the parents are talking in. And our school could not find the teacher, Ukrainian teacher, but in 2022, they found one. So it also shows some kind of tendency. So the word changes a lot, and both uh, request and um, like offer and demand but actually it's hard to say how it will be developed further because um, just like Ms. Irina mentioned about the resources there is lack of resources it's not only about ukrainian language but in general this humanitarian uh, field all over the country it is reduced and studying like different languages indeed it's reduced then we have a question, right, whether this interest to Ukraine, which very often is shown in the desire to study the language, to get involved into the culture, whether it won't be kind of a trap for us that later on when the interest will be lower and there will be even bigger lack of resources we will have uh, to cope with even bigger problems. What we won't um, say about that, but uh, as for the other side of the Black Sea, what did the word change there? So the experience from the other side of the Black Sea is um, different and even opposite a bit because the mechanism launched by this war in Turkey 
They were strongly motivated, modeled, and made by the soft power, which is done from the Russian side in Turkey. It's a very um, good saying of Eugenia, who mentioned one time that here they are looking at us as a deadly sick people, you know, with sympathy, but with no hope. That is grants, programs, they are stopped. This is about the Ministry of Culture. This is about uh, the activity of Cultural Institute in Ukraine. And also when the attache on education in Ukraine was not assigned in the embassy and so on. So you know many similar things. And there is also one really emotional phrase which I heard from the relatives of our alumnus uh, in Ukrainian studies. One lady said that it's a sin to say so, but for my child it's good that the war started in Ukraine because uh, the world structure, for example, the UN, took them, employed them, and if not the war, then my child would have no job. So from the other side, it's a practice of opportunities based on all those projects, processes, uh, in our opinion, interest and support of crime Tatar culture and uh, crime Tatar people increased. So you understand that Istanbul University is in the center of the tourist uh, region where there is St. Sophia and all the tourists, they are going just in this flow and it was nonstop. At first everyone was coming to us and then they were readdressed to the embassies and so on and so forth because it's really far to go there, so maybe here people can help us. So all the crime tatars were here. They came to say like what happened on um, in uh, the Crimea and so on. So we created crime tatar uh, library from what they presented. Then we presented. Then we made up the library in Turk languages, and then the cathedral of modern Turk languages from Istanbul University and they offer the course. Um, so I delivered this course in Ukraine. So it was a separate uh, course in crime tatar language. And if we had, for example, like 20 uh, people usually, so here we had 120 and the students who had the rating, the rating score was much higher. Those who were listening massively about what kind of languages we have, what kind of Turk languages, what is the state policy and so on. And there, on this wave of raising the Ukrainian studies, the Turkish ministry and Turkish budget, they gave some grants for studying to the Turk uh, studies. We took wonderful specialists from the Crimea and now it became really fruitful. So first time the modern uh, studies in um, Istanbul, there was created a wonderful etymological vocabulary of uh, Crimean Tatar language. So now it's the top top problem, top issue which exists for Crimean and Tatar uh, culture. It's the comparative historical vocabulary which includes uh, these like the memory and the history and so on. Now we have really cool, wonderful and good specialists who m managed to head these Crimean Tatar studies. And nowadays, any support, any lobbying from the side of the Turkish government is present. So this opinion about opening some kind of Crimean Tatar like language and literature, how just like the Ukrainian uh, study started since 2018, it was promoted with the promotion of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. We managed to open the same division of Crimean and Tatar language in Turkey. Of course, we have certain limitations because there is a huge political will for that that was needed. Uh, but uh, there were already some steps done and I would like to mention that the basics uh, is Everything is ready for that, uh, both availability of the staff and 
availability of materials so we are waiting only for the political uh, will political decision so again the issue of motivation as it was mentioned earlier is very important so that people should choose this they should specialize themselves on this not to take it the course uh, from the like EU languages or um, American languages but uh, I think that in Turkey this is launched already this is working and only with a good opinion with the good point of view to things we have somehow to do this Thank you very much. It seems to me that Ms. Irena just uh, gave the floor to you, Mr. Martin, so I won't take much time. So how do you see this? Thank you very much. How the world changed the situation? From one side, of course, uh, there are some changes and we can feel that in the grand sphere and the invitation of Ukrainian um, participants in different conferences, different events. From the other side, uh, there are actually no huge changes. That is what we were discussing with our colleagues. These are either some points of changes, but they are not huge and they are not those that are working for the prospects. And just like Ms. Irina mentioned, there is a huge danger that uh, we still uh, have Russian Federation as our competitor in this uh, field, academic and educational and research field. And we are not even saying that the grants are given to Russians, but we are saying that they continue their studies and they continue to just take everything on themselves, just like Ms. Irina mentioned, that opening the Crimean Tatar studies in Istanbul, and also that uh, Crimean Tatars are studied in Italy right now. They are studied, so there is uh, one researcher who is uh, studying Italians from the Crimea. So we know that Crimea is occupied and you can't get access there. You can go from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine or you just can go to Moscow and from Moscow to Crimea. It's easier, simpler and more prospects. So not only one Italian student is using that, but authors and researchers, scientists from all over the world are doing this. And Russians are gladly getting you involved. And there was also the Crimean Review um, magazine, which is in, not in Bakhtisaray, but it's um, in Russia, but the best uh, researchers from America, researchers even from Kiev, but we will just leave the issue um, about moral uh, aside. So all these efforts, Russian efforts, they didn't stop on 24th of February. They continue from now on and they are concentrated both in Russia itself and also still they are acting in those locations abroad and we have to consider these things because it's not only the challenge to expand and create uh, studies but also to develop those. Of course the war as I mentioned in the first part that more and more uh, professionals um, who like annually who like um, were doing the studies for like 50 years and more, not only Ukrainian studies, I mean, but also like Kazakhstan, if you mention. So here is a big problem, what we can offer. I am from those people who are sure that initiative should come from Ukraine and we cannot just blindly rely on that in Harvard, they will write more books for us and those books we will use both for ourselves and for students. Um, of uh, foreign educational, higher educational establishments. So this strategy is a wrong strategy, actually. So we need to begin with the translation of the books written, already written in Ukraine from my side. I can say that we have such materials that um, it is worth to pay attention to. And we can talk about uh, the good and quality to increase uh, of the quality of studies because uh, they are emerging, they are 
happening even though the state doesn't have much resources because it seems to me that we don't need to have a lot of resources but we need just to, to distribute correctly the resources that we have so summing up it seems to me that we need to talk not uh, that to say not that uh, the Ukrainian studies were changed by war, but how our attitude changed to that problem and whether we are understanding the challenges that are there and whether we are ready to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for such sober words from all the three participants. And uh, summing up, I would like to mention that recently I was also participating in one discussion with my colleagues from Iraq. And uh, among them, I also mentioned uh, that to a great extent, we as a specialist from Ukraine who are working with the Ukrainian topic or the topic of Crimean Tatar studies uh, regarding our uh, colleagues, Western co colleagues, we are data harvesters and local voices. Quite often, we have no chance to produce the paradigm theoretical models because they expect data from us and they can do it for us. What Mr. Martin said, if we definitely will not just wait for someone to write it in Stanford, but do it ourselves. This will change the international academic allocation and distribution of labor. So, any questions from the audience, colleagues? If you want to ask panelists about anything, this is a very good moment to do it. Okay, questions? Please. Greetings, Yehor Brolyan. Uh, international Affairs student. So, Ms. Yulia, tell me please, um, in Sweden, did the public opinion change about Ukraine? So, uh, starting from February 24th, did it change? And uh, another question on Sweden. Uh, of course, Ukraine and Sweden, they have the same battle next to Poltava and uh, Irina is polarizing this Swedish topic as you know how can history uh, enhance the friendship of Ukraine and Sweden how can we popularize Ukraine in Sweden and vice versa thank you thank you for a very good question two questions I By the way, we have a question from Ostap Kredek in Q&A. He asks about Nazifying Ukrainian issue, because these are related a little bit. Um, in February, on February 24th, you know, we had a moment when these discourses were a little bit unclear, and uh, journalists, they instantly asked about Azov, about Nazi, and so on, Nazi context. In Sweden, there was an interesting situation because the country is small, we know each other, <laughs> all the researchers, and uh, we all autonomously presented this approach. We did not comment upon that. We just said that you uh, repeat the Russian narrative, we have to talk about uh, victims in Ukraine because there is an actual war taking place, genocidal war, and uh, talking about uh, Azov and uh, Putin's narrative, you know, it was unacceptable. And this discourse changed a lot. In a couple of weeks, nobody was asking this. There was a discussion. There was a professional discussion, I would say, and uh, what happened in Sweden with the pl uh, public discussions. A lot of space was given to specialists of the military area. Yeah, military experts, they comment the war. So I think it was a very good decision. It was logical. War is ongoing, and uh, military experts are the best to comment on that. <laughs> Truly, we've observed ourselves how this discourse changed. 
from from the Russian propaganda product to professional discussions, evidence-based discussions. I was asked so much about the memorials that today are destroyed in Ukraine, like how can we understand this? It became less emotional. There is no emotional coloring of saying, oh, you are Russophobics. No, people are just trying to understand why it's happening. And this decolonization perspective gives a lot. I start telling about Confederate memorials in US <laughs> and they actually understand that. Okay, they say, okay, this is the framework. Okay, we understand what's happening. Uh, this is about public opinion and attitude. The history, well, a lot of topics we can use to describe Ukrainian and Swedish history. But what Marina is doing, it's really great. She concentrates on the period I never dealt with, 18th century, and uh, she's checking the materials in Swedish archives, maybe revealing something new from Ukrainian history. I thought a lot about the discussions of the Nobel Committee on candidates from Ukraine. Maybe Ivan Franko. Discussion Ivan Franko. That would be really interesting to see. If I have time, I'll do it. Thank you. Anything else? Please. Greetings. Andrea Vramanko, Ukrainian world journalist. I'd like to ask Ms. Irina Driha. You said that our studies are perceived in Turkey as uh, uh, patients in coma. So uh, with the previous question about Sweden, can you tell us uh, how we are perceived in Turkey, what topics are interesting and uh, how they perceive us? I mean, how they perceive Ukraine. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. A lot is written about it, and uh, so many experts dealt with that. Those people who are in the Ukrainian context, they are very well aware from the Turkish block. But from the Turkish block, we can, these are mostly again Russian studies or former Russian studies specialists who try, after they read Karamzin, they try to give judgments about Ukraine. So the spectrum of uh, ideas is big. There are now big, there are now these powerful bloggers and influencers, Turkish ones, and they stick to this proper rational agenda. They don't only take news from Russian Sputnik, but um, they get some alternative sources. And they have a big number of followers we have pro-governmental structures, of course. We have these uh, left and right wings, like like in any <laughs> like a typical political spectrum. We have these Dugin friends, as I call them, you know. He comes to Ankara. Uh, Dugin is translated in Turkish, by the way, and we have these books in all like the shops, even like in the small towns. But Ukrainian history is not that popularized. But in Turkey, you will not find Ukrainian history in Turkish. So, in each of these cases, well, unfortunately, again, we have problems with connection, so. so. 
Menos que manos. И на рівні якої там працює, але безперечно, те, що наразі. Of course, Russian content, Russian informational flow of propaganda is it's it's like overwhelming. Ukrainian voice is weaker. We have experts, active experts, uh, Ukrainian experts. They've already managed to get some good results, but this is the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Irina. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, to both offline and online audiences, my gratitude. Thank you for listening to this discussion, and I do hope that um, now we understand it better. What's happening with Ukrainian studies, how these are delivered? We, we're looking forward to get some new publications from you, dear researchers. Uh, have a nice and safe day, and thank you.